There's no time. No. O'clock. All right, we're back. This episode's going to be another one of the true crime episodes because you guys yeah. request that one. You guys request true crime like crazy. So. That's what I mean. I'm so, sure you guys miss the true crime, but you know. Yeah. We got we do other stuff too. Everybody yeah. likes different things. We like everybody likes different things. things yeah. <laughs> the, um, uh, the show we did last week about Eugene Sandow, Eugene Sandow and a lot of the other guys that uh, started off bodybuilding, you know, actually is getting a little bit more popular than, than I thought it would be. You know, people that was there in the comments in the section, like, I probably wouldn't have listened to a show like this before, but since it was you guys, I listened to it, and it was fucking hilarious. It is a hilarious show. If you guys want to go back and check it out, it may not sound real exciting, you know what I mean, to a person who doesn't know anything about it, but... There's a lot of interesting characters back in the fucking late 1800s, early 1900s that started that whole thing. And that's that's really where the idea of the show came from. It was like strong men and mostly like guys like Eugene Sandow, you know, and fucking how, how much they changed things and what kind of fucking big characters they were in terms of the fucking the weird shit that they did. And, you know, fucking trying to... People were trying to get male enhancement by sewing fucking goat nuts into their fucking testicles and shit so they'd have three balls it's fucking all kinds of crazy shit people try to do i don't even know if they have tried to have three balls i think they were like replacing their balls with goat. yeah basically it was like an attempt at trt it was an attempt at testosterone replacement therapy which i don't know how desperate you'd have to be to do that shit but you know they did some stupid shit they did some stupid shit back then so i mean people do stupid shit now but it's like i don't think it's nothing compared to like what old timey people did you go back (laughs) they didn't know anything you go back and read the comments on that show you'll see people Saying, man, I never would have watched a show like this if it wasn't for you guys. The fucking show is hilarious. It's a hilarious show. You guys want to It was a more interesting topic than I was uh, yeah. anticipating, actually. Yeah, it's but, h- you know. hilarious. Well, guys with big egos do hilarious shit. And, you know, and I point people in the right direction where they can go fucking. They either do hilarious out. shit or terrible shit. <laughs> Sometimes you want to say. <laughs> Sometimes. Sometimes both of those yeah. are the same thing. Yeah. Today so, we're talking about a much less awesome individual. Yeah. It's very funny because this was this has been requested a couple of times a long time ago. And I think I kind of hinted around at like what the um what the topic was gonna be, like on one of the sidetrack shows. I think it was like Thursdays. And I said it's a German serial killer, and it was like a long time ago, like it was like the beginning of the twentieth century or something. And I thought it was funny because somebody in the YouTube comments tried to guess. And they guessed like a whole bunch and none of them were the right one. And because that was something that I wanted to discuss. I'm not really sure. Okay, so I'm going to start this whole thing. You know, I'm going to do shout outs and everything too. But here's like a little preamble. What the fuck, Germany? Because (laughs) in the time period in between, roughly in between the First and Second World War, y'all had an alarming number of serial killers running around and like fucked up ones too, like cannibals and all this kind of shit. And... I, I don't think anyone is entirely sure why that is. I, I don't know if it's because there were actually more of them running around or if it was just because uh, Germany at the time, they kept better records or the cops were better and they caught them, um, you know, so they identified them and stuff like that. But I'm not really sure why that should be, but there are a really, really lot of them. We've talked about one of them on the show before, I think back on our Vampire Killers show, uh, Fritz Harman. What time period did you say again? Uh, between the First and Second World War. Okay. Re- thereabouts. Okay. Uh, but yeah, there were like a whole bunch of different ones. I just thought it was very funny that like the the person in the YouTube comment was like guessing a bunch of different ones. And I'm like, all good guesses, but no. Uh, we are actually today talking about Peter Curtin, the vampire of Dusseldorf. I don't think I've ever heard of this guy. Which is amazing because, wow. Okay. Wow. What, what year are we talking about? What a horrible, horrible person. Very early 20th century. Like from, like right around, um, his his kind of heyday was like 1929, 1930. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. Well, you had some weird shit like that going, going on through, in the United States too. I mean, you had, uh, shit, the guy who um, built his own murder hotel and what was H.H. Holmes. H.H. Yeah. Holmes. You had him. Uh, it's just... I don't know. Maybe it's maybe it's some kind of phase that fucking societies go through, like a cycle. 
It could be, because I do feel like, and we've mentioned this on the show before, but it's like, you know, I wrote about a lot of crimes that happened in the early part of the 20th century, and a lot of fucked up shit happened back then. Remember, like, because remember I was saying how there was just this big rash of, like, axe murders? Yeah. Like, all over the place. They weren't, like, related or anything. I don't know if it was just because axes, like, everybody had one, so it was kind of like a weapon of convenience type of shit. Well, remember that, remember that point... Yeah, it's like statistical. Yeah. But you remember that one time we were we were talking about in Canada, there's a place where like there's yeah, yeah. cities next to each London, other. London, Ontario. L- yeah, London, Ontario. It had something to do with the construction of some highways. Yeah. And the fact that the economy went bad and, and the cities started to stagnate. And uh, and a bunch of them, there was like an outbreak there. Yeah. I think it has to do with like a lot of things at once. Easy transportation. Yeah, it's kind of like, like a perfect storm of factors. Yeah, like an easy, you have a free society with easy transportation and a a a well-built city scape but it's undergoing contraction like you know what i mean like there's an economic decline yeah which you know it's kind of like parasites coming out and feeding on it or or maggots coming out of the woodwork to feed on a damn dead body or something yeah you know what i mean uh there's a lot of cityscape there and a lot of little nooks and crannies and a lot of people a lot of the good people are leaving leaving behind kind of like you know a rougher type people or people that don't have the ability to move so they all start cannibalizing one another in a way yeah you know maybe i was that was the idea i had back then that i i think that was probably the thing behind london ontario i think the thing about that was that it was kind of like a large city that had largely been kind of like cut off from other cities around it but then like all these new highways started to get built through it and there was like all these new um you know, people coming through, like, more transient uh, population, um, which usually amounts to more serial killers, which is why there were so many in California, like, in the 60s and 70s, because you get this big influx of people, um, you know, moving there. And uh, with the big influx of people comes people preying on that big influx of people. Like H.H. Holmes. Yeah, which I think is what... In the World's Fair. Yeah, which happened in Chicago. Right. The thing about... Maybe that was happening in Germany. I don't know. I feel like maybe... I feel like maybe it was a kind of thing because there was a lot of poverty, there was a lot of social unrest, there was a lot of that, but there was a lot of that going on in other parts of Europe and in parts of the US as well, and you didn't see this spike. I suspect, and I'm not the only person that suspects this, there's other crime writers that have uh, that have kind of theorized this as well, is that maybe it's just because the German uh, police force, the, the authorities and stuff like that were actually better organized and um, had better uh, kind of like forensic techniques and stuff like that and could catch these guys more and you heard about them more because the thing about it is that peter curtin in particular um a psychologist named dr carl berg he wrote a book about this guy he was actually the pathologist that did like um the autopsies on most of his victims so he was like right there through the whole case he knew all about it and he interviewed the guy like extensively before he was executed and he wrote a book called The Sadist, and it came out in the 30s. Um, it's, you know, it's in the public domain. You can read I have the PDF. Like, I haven't, I didn't have time to read the whole thing, but I, like, you know, kind of skimmed through parts of it and everything, like, trying to just get the thing. And it is um, amazingly modern, like, in its breakdown of why this dude wa- was the way he was. You know what Another I mean? thing that could, could be is that, if he's a German serial killer in Germany, he's going to be contained inside Germany. If you have a serial killer in the United States, there's a bunch of states and they all speak English. He kills in one state and he can move on to yeah, another one. Yeah, he hops one on a train. And, and hops on a train. And now he's in another state so they never catch him. Yeah. So it's easier to catch him if he's contained inside Germany. That's true. As so well. not only is it a better police force, just more effective because they don't have to fucking cooperate. They don't have to communicate and cooperate with people outside of germany to catch a dude i think that really did stymie a lot of stuff uh, happened that happened here. early in the you know yeah. in the united states history is that all you had to do and we've mentioned this before as well Go all right you had there. to do was like pop over to another state change your name you were free and no one would be the wiser yeah the united states is because it's a bunch of states that got united they yeah. they really are independent they really were independent countries and particularly back then back I mean, then is even more so yeah and yeah. they didn't have like any way of communicating yeah. with one another or, like you could matching up yeah it was like motorized bandits like Bonnie and Clyde would commit a fucking heinous robbery and kill cops right near the fucking border line between two states 
and just drive across the border, and the other cops would just stop and watch them go. Couldn't do anything. Yeah. And then cops on the other side of the border couldn't even do anything. Couldn't charge them or arrest them because that, that crime wasn't committed it wasn't in, their in their state. Ju- it wasn't, it wasn't their in their jurisdiction. jurisdiction. Yep. So they eventually got rid of that. That, that around that time yeah there because you can see how that would be right. like a really bad um thing to have yeah to the feds made it, the feds made an interstate compact between all the states that the states had the right to each state had a right to arrest you for a crime committed in another state and also so, shit too like now you have the fbi where if if you right. take a crime over state lines then it's, the fbi becomes involved yeah. if it's a bad enough it's a murder yeah and, and they're better than the state police right so so that's kind of what happened. But yeah, so I kind of want to get, I'll, I'll kind of like go into some of the other like serial killers just very briefly and then we'll talk about uh, Peter Curtin because this guy, ugh. and it, it's weird because he's not one that comes up a lot with like when you talk about like really horrible serial killers, but he is for real, like just straight up evil. He had like the ver- a very similar thing because remember when we did the show about Carl Panzram, yeah, who was just kind of like his whole thing was just revenge and he just hated everybody. Yeah, man, he's a rapist. Yeah, raping men, just this, men, just men. This guy was similar, even, but he was like less. It, he was very sexually motivated. He was a lust killer. Uh, he was, you know, women and little girls mainly. He did kill men also, um, so he was kind of indiscriminate, and. Um, even though I think his primary motivation was sexual, and he admitted as much, um, he did actually have a big thing where he was taking revenge against society because of the way that he had grown up and the way that he had been treated, like, in cars. And he was, to be fair, he was horribly, horribly abused when he was a child. Not excusing the dude, um, but... Just made a monster. Yeah, it, he definitely did uh, turn out... A, a monstrous individual with who admitted openly that he had no conscience, no pity, no remorse about anything. He was just like kind of that's how he got his jollies. Hmm. You know what I mean? Just by doing this like fucked up sadistic shit. But yeah, I recommend the book uh, The Sadist, like I said, by Dr. Carl Berg. You can find it online. It's free. Um, you can download it from archive.org. I think that's where I got it, like a PDF of the original. And uh, like I said, it's 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 a very modern. Uh, look into like a serial killer it's it could have been written you know just a couple years ago which i was kind of amazed about so let's just do a couple of uh brief shout outs before we kind of get into it i wanted to thank again nile uh hopefully i'm pronouncing that right like i said he never corrects me so i guess i'm pronouncing it sort of right uh who gave us a paypal donation um i thanked him on the sidetrack show but like i said i always like to save the main shit for the show um i don't remember if we thanked rob on the main show for sending us sexy beast but if yeah. i haven't thank you again yeah we, we still you have to watch it we yeah we, i still gotta watch that like yeah. i said it's an awesome movie like i've yeah. seen it before i saw it in the theater also i just wanted to i i said this on the sidetrack show but in case you guys don't listen to those um that i was going to I mean, we're not going to stop doing the sidetrack show we're still going to put content up every single day but what I decided I might do, particularly with the matinee show, was I just thought it was kind of pointless now that we don't do the A-list thing anymore where we go to the theater and all that other kind of stuff. I thought it was pointless to just like lump all the three new movie reviews together on one show. And so I decided to just like break them up like during the week. Yep. So we're going to put up like three matinee shows like during the, with just one movie. Like we talk right. about one movie. We, or we might do three, we might do four, we might do two, we might do whatever. But then if there's a day when we don't have anything going up, like a movie review, then we'll do a sidetracks right. show. So we'll always have something going up. It just might not necessarily be a sidetracks. It might be a matinee. It might be an old movie review or something else. It'll yeah. be something else. So I just want to, that's kind of the goal is I want to have like one thing going up every single day. The sidetrack show was really just a temporary thing anyway. That was for the pandemic. And now that that's kind of getting, that's winding down, uh, we're just going to, we're just going to kind of, like I said, we'll keep it. But we're just going to make sure that one thing goes up every day. Yeah, the sidetracks... It may be different each day, but... The yeah. sidetracks will probably be just to fill in... Fill in dead days. If we don't have something, if we don't have a movie review for that day, or if we don't have something yeah. else going up for that. Everything else is going to stay the same. The movie retrospective is still going to go up on Friday. Witching Hour is still going to go up on Thursday. The regular stuff is still going to go up on uh, right. Tuesday. But all the other days, we're going to either put a matinee or a sidetrack yeah. show. Oh. All new, yeah, all new movies. There won't be a matinee, really. All new movies will be reviewed separately. Yeah, and I mean it'll we'll still about, it'll still be called matinee, but yeah, th- it'll just be just one be movie one. instead of three. Right. You know what I mean? Like and we'll still do re- we'll still do retrospectives. Yeah, we'll do at least one retrospective. Like I said, yep. if we watch more than one, like 
old movie a week and we'd feel like reviewing that too i might put two up a week we just don't know but something will go up every day so uh don't be alarmed we're not getting rid of anything really we're just kind of like yeah. trying to streamline stuff streamline the production. so we always have something to talk about like on the show so now as i was saying um there really were a lot of like kind of heavy hitter serial killers operating in germany between roughly between World War One and World War Two, you had Carl Denke, known as Papa Denke, <laughs> serial hmm. killer Papa Denke. Okay, uh, he was actually a cannibal. Also, he actually went after uh, homeless people and people that were traveling. Uh, he's uh, called the Forgotten Cannibal. Hmm. I, I don't know how you could forget somebody like that, but okay. Uh, he there didn't was have a, good press. I guess not. There was also uh, Carl Grossman, also a cannibal. Um, he actually, they don't know a lot about, I mean, they know he committed a shit ton of crimes and like eight people, but they don't know how, like exactly what the, all the details of it were because he killed himself before he could be brought to trial. Then you got Dole Fritz Harmon, who, like I said, he we talked about him, I think on our Vampire Killers show, because he's called the Vampire of Hanover, the Butcher of Hanover. Um, he killed at least 24 boys and young men, uh, murder, mutilation, and dismemberment. Then you have, uh, Johan Mayer, who, a one-armed serial killer, maybe the only one, I never heard of any other one. Uh, they called him, uh, Stump Farm, huh. like Stump Arm, you know right, what I mean? Yeah. Uh, he was born that way or lost an arm? I'm not sure, actually. Stomp arm. I think he was born that way. Probably born that way, yeah. But yeah. So, like as if you know of any other one-armed serial killers, he's a one-armed serial killer. Uh, he actually killed uh, five people, I believe. Then there was Friedrich Schumann, known as the Terror of Falkenhagen Lake. Hmm. He murdered seven people and raped 11 women and was executed in 1921. Then you had Paul Ogorzo. Or Ogorzao? I don't know. Uh, he was a serial killer and rapist known as the S-Bahn murderer. He killed eight women in Nazi area Berlin between October 1940 and July 1941. So, you know, and that's even before we get to Peter Curtin. So there's, and there's more of them than that. Those are just kind of like the main ones that kind of get talked about. I should say, too, that Peter Curtin uh, and, I believe, um, Fritz Harman were the kind of dual inspirations for the very famous classic horror movie, Fritz Lang's M, about the child killer. So, uh, which, you know, with Peter Lorre. I didn't see it. You've never seen it? No. Oh, it's good. <clears throat> it came out in the 30s. Yeah, I didn't see it. Yeah, oh, it's good. But that's what, okay. this is who it's based on, like loosely gotcha. based on, uh, it's, it's kind of like a fictionalized child killer that's kind of based on Peter Curtin and a couple other serial killers. So, all right. So let's talk about this fucking douchebag. So it's like Peter Curtin, the U has an umlaut because he's metal. <laughs> he's really not metal. Like, he's yeah. not cool at all. He's like all right. a really horrible human being. So, uh, as I said, he's called the Vampire of Dusseldorf or the Dusseldorf Monster. Committed a series of murders and sexual assaults between February and November 1929. Although there were some before that. And like, this dude did everything. Murders, rapes, uh, arson, burglary, just fucking, he, he was incorrigible. He would just go around, like, stabbing people, like, at fucking random, like, in the street yeah. and stuff. He was just like a... Uh, uh, How old was he when he started all this? <coughs> you gonna tell us? Well, he start when he, when he first started killing yeah. people, according to him, nine. Okay. Fuck. <laughs> Damn. His first murders were when he was nine, or right. so he claimed. Um... I mean, the the kids were dead. It's just, right. you know, they it was ruled an accent, but I'll get into that. So, uh, you know, like I said, he also had like a shit ton of attempted murders as well. He was ultimately convicted of, um, I think, seven murders? Either seven murders or nine murders. I can't remember. And a whole bunch of attempted murders, even though he probably did like a shit ton more than that. Because he confessed like as soon as they like got him in custody because he knew he was caught. So, he was born uh, in Mulheim am Rhein, which I think is near Cologne. And he was born in 1883. Now, he was the oldest of 13 children. And his family lived in a one-bedroom apartment. Damn. 13 of them in one room. Yeah. Yeah, that's bound to fuck you up. And, well, just wait. Yeah. 
<laughs> now, apparently the, the parents had had two kids before him, but I guess they had both died, like, really young. Okay. Um, so I don't know if it's 13 total, like, or, total 13 or if survived. it's 13, including those okay. two. You know what I mean? It's not right. real clear about that. So the family was super, super poor, mostly because uh, the dad was a drunk. Um, he had a job. He was he worked in a like a molder, like they made moldings or whatever. Um, but he spent almost all of his money on booze. Yeah. And he was also violently abusive and liked to uh, rape the mom in front of the other kids like he would gather all the kids and rape their mom and make the kids watch damn also later on went into raping the sisters damn so you know so he's already coming out of a fucking piss poor environment yeah yeah it's really really not good yeah so um it, weirdly uh, it seems like the um the dad actually did get arrested for incest right uh, for having sex with one of the daughters who was 13 at the time yeah she probably went to the cops yeah i'm right. see, i think well actually i think what ended up happening was that the cops came to the house because they were investigating one of peter's uh you know burglaries or whatever yeah and while they were there either so, like somebody told the police hey he's been yeah. like raping the daughter or whatever so they arrested the dad so i think he only got maybe a little over a year in prison for that right though but you know um i think unusually for the time because i i just feel like that's unusual for the time because i feel like just a lot of people just get away with it yeah you know what i mean probably did back then yeah, like beating up your wife and kids, raping your kids. I just feel like people are like, eh. They were like, well, that's between those people. That's Yeah, I, I feel like that's what happens. Well, that's what happens. And those right. poor people over there, you know. And so I feel like they don't do anything. So after that happened, like after he went to jail for incest with the daughter, um, Peter Curtin's mom actually got uh, a divorce, you know, luckily yeah. for her. And uh, she actually remarried and moved to Dusseldorf. Now, as if this home situation wasn't horrifying enough, um, after they moved to Dusseldorf, there was um, the building that they lived in, and this was when Peter was about nine years old. There was this other guy who was like in his 40s, I think, and he lived in the same building, and he was a dog catcher. And him and Peter started hanging out, even though this guy was in his 40s and Peter was nine. Now... The dog catcher showed this little kid how to, like, jerk off dogs and how to torture animals and got him into bestiality. Okay. Damn. Um, so Peter was like, nice. Yeah. So already, yeah. like I said, already this kid is messed up. Right. Now, <laughs> this, just so, this is a terrible, terrible story. Damn. Yeah. So, yeah, so they were, like, really close friends and hung out together and, like, went around torturing dogs and raping dogs and jerking dogs Jeez. off and all this other kind of stuff. So, you know, just regular kid stuff. Well, that's why he became a dog catcher. And well, get, yeah, exactly. Yeah, and then, then, of course, you know you know who's... We, we got we got old what's-his-name, our favorite dog catcher right back there. Shit, he's out of reach. <laughs> well, you know, just because just because he's a dog catcher, that doesn't, that doesn't mean anything. He's not, you know... BTK I, wasn't a dog catcher. He was a... Um, he, he started was, off as a dog catcher, I think. He did, did, wasn't he, he a dog catcher for a while? Um, I don't think he was exactly. He was like a code enforcement person, okay, so like and it might I think. Have just included so dogs. I think it yeah. included like if okay. there were stray dogs and stuff like yeah, that, he would he have was, to take them to the pound or whatever. Yeah, because he was he was hassling that one victim about yeah. her dog and shit. Yeah. So I thought he was also not only code enforcement. I thought it involved fucking catching people's dogs too. Yeah, I think like it kind or of maybe all he fell, called a dog catcher and they did it. Yeah, I think it all like fell under the same okay. umbrella because right. I think he did actually have to like take dogs to the yeah, pound if they were running. Yeah, yeah, because yeah. because he was. Um, I remember reading like in the book that Sophie sent me that he seemed kind of like upset that people were calling him a dog catcher because okay. that wasn't exactly what his job okay. was. You know right. what I mean? Yeah. It was part of his job, but it right. wasn't his whole job. Now, right around the same time that Peter Curtin is hanging around with this fucked up older dude, this dog catcher person, um, he also later said. That him and two of his little friends, I guess they weren't his friends, but two other little boys that were about his age, they were out um, on a on the Rhine River, like in a raft or something, like going rafting like little kids do. 
And apparently Peter decided he was going to push one of them into the river to see what would happen. So he pushed one of them into the river. The other kid was like, hey, bro, what are you up to? And he jumped in to save the other kid. At which point, Peter leans over the raft and holds them both under the water. Damn. And drowns them. Drowns them both, huh? Yep. Shit. Now, this was actually uh, later said that uh, it was found to be accidental. Because, you know, I guess he just came back and said, hey, they fell in and drowned. There was nothing I could do about it. Right. And I think that he said something to the effect was this was one of the first times that he realized that he could basically just do whatever he wanted to. Yeah. And, and, and just lie about it and right. people would buy it. You know what I mean? And that, like, made him feel, like, really powerful and stuff. So he drowned these two fucking kids when he was nine years old. So that's nice. Now, another thing that um, started to happen around this time, right around the time that he was going through puberty, like I said, this dog catcher guy had, like, um, introduced him to the joys of bestiality, I suppose. So he was getting into that. uh, It's like homosexual bestiality, too. uh, He was having sex with the male dogs. Isn't that what you're implying? Yeah, I guess so. Yeah, well, I don't yeah. know if it was it was just whatever dog they just, found. Okay, maybe male or if female. it was a male, they would just like grab the red rocket and just go to town. Just grab the red rocket. Yeah. <laughs> they would just go to town. Damn. This is not a G-rated show. Yeah. Damn. <laughs> <laughs> the red rocket. Fuck. There's a name for that. Okay. You didn't know that that's what it was not called. Not even know what it's called. <laughs> Jenny's fucking perverse. <laughs> I don't know how I know that either. <laughs> I just heard it somewhere, like, several times. I was like, oh, okay, that's what it's called. I don't know. I didn't look it up or anything. (laughs) So so he graduates from from dogs, and then he starts, um, you know, performing bestiality on, like, sheep and goats, like, at nearby stables. And I guess he got into a thing where he could only really, like, the orgasm was heightened Mm -hmm. if... He stabbed the sheep while he was fucking it. Damn. Like, because he had, like, a weird sexual thing. And this seemed to have, like, just popped out, like, fully developed when he was uh, going through puberty. To, like, blood gushing. Like, he was really yeah. into that. Like, he, so he was into, like, having sex with a victim, raping a victim or an animal or whatever while its blood was, was gurgling out. That was like a Damn. really like a really erotic charge for him. Like sometimes he ju- he would just go back to a scene later where he had done something, and just thinking about it would make him like Damn. pop off. You know what I mean? It's funny you'd think a sheep would fucking fucking kill him for doing that. I mean they're pretty strong. Well, maybe that's how he discovered it. Maybe he yeah. was like um, having his way with one, and that sheep decided they didn't fucking like it, and started like fighting him, and so he stabbed it. Well, no, I'm talking about stabbing it would make it even yeah. worse. You would think an enraged sheep would probably kill you. I don't know. Well, I guess not, makes because want, he did it wonder, more than once. Makes me wonder if he kind of made that up. Like, maybe he was having sex with a sheep, but I, maybe I, makes me doubt that he was stabbing him while he was doing it, and that he could get away with that, because you would think an animal would instinctively fight back. Yeah. And, you know, I don't know how big he was at that time. He was going through puberty, but how big was he? I mean, yeah. I'm thinking this was, like, around when he was 12 or 13 years old. Because a sheep, man, fucking enraged sheep fighting for its life, I think would kill, maybe kill a kid. Li- maybe he, like, picked on little ones. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, maybe. You know, maybe like little lambs. Yeah. But even they would could fight back pretty hard. You know. I mean, they have hooves. I mean, a twenty pound bobcat can fucking kill you. Yeah. You know, but like a but then again, a sheep isn't a bobcat. But yeah, I I never underestimate you know the strength of an animal. Well, yeah. Majors put me in the fucking hospital. (laughs) Well, she, she did just bite me fucking. She ba- did <laughs> bite me down the bone. Yeah, you one were time. in the hospital for like a week or yeah. something like that. Got fucking that infection from that fucking cat, cat bite. Scratch fever. It wasn't That's not cat what it was though. Fever. It was no. like yeah, it was like uh, it was staff of some yeah, sort from from her little yeah. Mouth. She didn't mean to bite no. you. It was just like an accident. Well, little bitty teeth are like hypodermic needles. You know, yeah. what I mean, the holes close up and then it gets infected in there. You know what I mean? And then. I thought it'd be all right. And then, like, two or three days later, I was like, uh, this isn't going good. Yeah, it, like, swelled way up. Yeah, and, like, this the, isn't going good. You could good. see the blood yeah. line, like, going up yeah. like that. Yeah, so I had to go to the damn hospital. Yeah, that sucked. I forgot what it was called. They had a name for the type of infection that it was. Yeah. It's, it wasn't that cat scratch fever. That's toxoplasmosis. Yeah, that's uh, yeah, it's yeah. something else. Yeah. Uh, that was just the first thing I thought of. Yeah, no. <laughs> no, fucking, I don't have toxoplasmosis. That's fucking worms in your brain. Yeah. <laughs> mm. 
So, uh, again, surprisingly, uh, not surprisingly, when uh, Peter Curtin was a teenager, um, his dad beat the crap out of him as well. Um, he was actually, did pretty good in school, but because of his home life, he couldn't really concentrate on anything, and he kept, like, running away from home. Um, and he kind of, like, when he ran away from home, he would, like, start hanging around with, like, a bunch of other, like, criminals and shit. Um, you know, stealing setting shit on fire, shit like that, like little kids do. So that's kind of how he, um, you know, made enough money to like stay out on the streets or like stay away from home for like extended periods of time just by stealing shit. Now, when he was 13 years old, um, he found, I don't want to call her a girlfriend, but he found this girl um, who would let him like take her clothes off and like feel her up and stuff. But wouldn't let him have sex with her. I mean, they're 13. So, yeah. you know, that's kind of the way that shit goes. So, you know, he, he started going back to, the, like, the sheep and the pigs and the goats and everything like that. Um, and then he targeted the same sister that his father had been raping. Right. Who was 13 or 14 years old at the time. So, that's nice. Because I guess he was, like, frustrated by this girl, like, not letting him get his rocks well, she off do? with her. What did who do? The sister. What did the sister do? About what? Oh, she just let it happen? Well, I don't know. She's a okay. little kid. You know what I mean? Okay. Well, 13's big enough to fucking fight back. She didn't tell anybody? Well, obviously they told yeah. somebody because yeah. the dad went to jail for it. Yeah, you'd think. Okay. I'm just but, saying. you know. So, 1897, um, Peter leaves school. Now, his dad got him an apprenticeship at the molding factory, like, that he worked at. Um, Curtin actually worked there for about two years, and then he decided, fuck this shit. He stole a bunch of money from his employer, uh, about 300 marks, and he stole some money from his own house and took off. He went to this town called Koblenz, and here he hooked up with a prostitute uh, who was only, I think, two years older than him. He was, like, a little bit older teenager at this uh, time. And he and she would let him, like, do whatever he wanted to her. Like, other than murdering her, right. obviously. Um, but he would let she would let him do, like, all kind of violent shit and everything. And I guess, like, she allowed it. Um, so that went on for about a month. And then he got uh, arrested for breaking and entering and theft. And went to prison uh, for only a month. So he gets out in August of 1899 and goes back on the streets and starts committing crimes and shit like that. Now, the first official murder that he said to commit, it was, I mean, if, if he is to be believed, the first murder that he committed were those two little boys that he drowned. Um, but since that was ruled accidental and they, you know, couldn't go back and do it because it was many years later, um, this is considered his first uh, official murder. This was November of 1899. He said that he picked up an 18 year old girl and asked her to come back with him to um, the Hofgarten, the Hofgarten, mm -hmm. whatever. And he um, had sex with her. I don't know if it was consensual or not, uh, or if it was rape. And then he strangled her to death with his bare hands. Now, because they never found a body in this case, they are assuming that either he made it up, although there's really no reason for him to have made it up uh, because he did much worse shit later on, or they speculate that this woman actually survived, like that he was actually left her for dead. Yeah, but she came back too. And then after yeah. he took off, she like crawled away and never reported it um, because they never could find her. But that, right. according to him, that was the first murder. She lived. He committed so it, but yeah. that's what most people think that she probably lived and took off and was like fuck this i'm not and then yeah like just never reported it so um he so he said that around this time that he committed this murder that was when he realized that the only way that he could achieve this kind of like really heightened orgasm or whatever like this bliss that he wanted to achieve was by murdering someone through violence you know what I mean? So that was kind of when that solidified for him, I suppose. So a little while after that, uh, he gets arrested for fraud. That was in 1900. Uh, he gets he spends a couple months in jail. He gets out, and then he gets arrested again the same year, 
for the same thing. Um, so, you know, like I said, he's just doing all this petty crime, which it's kind of common with serial killers. They do these kind of like burglary thefts and shit like that. He was kind of like, cause I guess he didn't have a job at this point. So that's kind of how he was surviving just by like stealing shit, you know, doing that kind of crap. Um, he also, there was also around this time, uh, he was arrested for attempted murder, um, for attempting to shoot a woman with a shotgun i believe it was uh but she lived so he got uh four years for that now he gets out in the summer of 1904 and gets drafted into the german army now he goes to um metz and was going to serve in the 98th infantry regiment although he was a very um he was one of those i hate authority people you know what I mean? Like, Car- very much like Carl Panzram, same yeah. kind of, like, uh, thing where he, he, like, hated everybody and he didn't want anybody telling him what to do. Um, so he deserted. Like, he, you know, he wasn't there very long and he, like, fucking took off. Later that same year, he got into arson. One of the things he really liked to do was he would go around and, like, set barns and houses and shit on fire because... And then, like, he would come back later, like, when the firefighters were there putting out the fire and everyone was there, like, freaking out. It's like, oh, my house or whatever. Because he got off on the chaos that he had caused and watching people, like, cry about, like, losing their property. And mm-hmm. I was like, he, like, that really, like, got his, you yeah. know, he got his jollies from, like, watching people's Sadistic. suffering. Yeah. Yeah. So that's why they called the book The Sadist, because he just, he really seemed to enjoy other people's. Misery. Well, he didn't have anything, so he didn't want anybody else to have anything. It does. It really does yeah. seem like he had that kind of... I mean, you know, like I said, he did have a really horrible, shitty childhood. Like I said, that's not excusing anything, but you can see where his mindset came from. Because yeah. he thought, well, everyone has treated me shitty, so I'm just going to treat everybody. I'm going to treat the world shitty right back because the world has crapped on me. Yeah. So I will crap on it in return. Which, like I said, very Carl Pan's room. That's right. the same kind of shit. Yeah. It's always funny how they go after the innocent ones, though. That I know. So and the, the thing. weird thing about him is that, I mean, according he to... He didn't go after his dad. Yeah. I'd have it, gone after my dad. <laughs> yeah, it's like you think you'd want to, yeah. like, rub out the people that, like, actually, yeah. like, caused your right. suffering, really, like, more than just a random person. I mean, what the fuck do they have to do with anything? Yep. But the weird thing about him is that... From what I read, because there was like, you know, he he talked to Dr. Carl Berg, who wrote the book, like a lot. And there's like a lot of like, uh, you know, uh, it, you know, interviews with him and stuff like that. And the strange thing about him is he's he's really, really intelligent and he really does seem to have a very um, he's very insightful about why he does what he does. He understands that he's attacking innocent people that didn't have anything to do with what happened to him. He understands yeah. that. Yeah. But he's saying that he he's like, care. well, yeah, one, he didn't care. And two, he had this weird thing like where um, it's almost kind of like, well, if the universe allowed it to happen or if God allowed it to happen, then God will understand like why I did it. And like, it'll like work itself out kind right. of thing. Like he had that kind of like right. I'm balancing the scales mm-hmm. or something. So he almost had, even though, like I said, he's primarily like a lust style killer. He also had a little bit of like mission style killer where right. he felt like he was revenging uh injustices yeah. and you know even if it's innocent people well nobody's innocent yeah. you know what i mean it's just, it just all works out on this so he really had that kind of thing so he um committed about 24 acts of arson uh mostly barns and stuff like you know um and he also he also said too that not only did he get off on watching the shit burn and watching people freaking out about it burning. But he also fantasized about there being um, homeless people sleeping in there and <laughs> that they were burning alive. Why homeless ones? Well, just people. Well, because okay. they were the ones that would be sleeping in a barn. Oh, oh, okay. He, you know, so he had a thing where he had sexual fantasies about killing large numbers of people at one time like right. either burning a whole house full of people alive or um like running a train off a track or something like that like he really got off hmm. on thinking about killing a whole bunch of people at once what this guy look like big guy little guy um he, he was pretty well built dude yeah. the weird thing about him is that 
Um, he was actually not a bad looking guy for the time. Yeah. And he always looked real dapper. Huh. Kind of like H.H. H. Holmes. Like right. he always had a real nice suit. He always had like his hair was always parted and combed and yeah. had his little pom- pomade in there okay. and All everything right. like that. Gasoline. So, so yeah. So he looked pretty slick. Yeah. Um, and I think that's kind of why. Because he was very um, narcissistic. Right. And he was like real vain about like his personal appearance. Like so, he wasn't like a dirty hobo or nothing right. like that. Like he okay. really did look like a like a respectable dude. So, um, because he had deserted from the army, uh, he got tried and convicted of desertion and got a whole bunch of other counts of arson, robbery, attempted robbery, blah de blah, and he went to prison from 1905 to 1913. That how did he get how did he get caught? Monster. Uh, I'm not really sure, okay. actually. They, they caught, just, him just caught him somehow. They just okay. caught him. <laughs> Somebody saw his ass walking down the street and was like, yeah. hey, you're that guy. It's probably there at too many scenes of the crime. Because, you know, no, no, it is. is like they knew, they, They've always known, or at least they've known in modern times, that a serial arsonist will be there in the crowd watching yeah. the fire. Yep. And, you know, they tell firemen to, you know, keep track of who's there. Look for the weirdo if, <laughs> that looks a little too happy about it. Yeah, and if you're spotted more than once... At fires, you're going to be a fucking suspect. Yeah, so, and rightly so. So maybe he just kept appearing at too he many kept fires. Up. Well, and that, they're like that motherfucker's doing it. That's not. Um, that's probably not too far out of the bounds of possibility yeah. because there are there were some cases where he turned up at the scenes of his murders, yeah. like to watch people like reacting to it. Yeah, like the next day and stuff. So that and was he, his downfall. I'm trying to bet. Um, yeah. that's actually not how he got caught, but no. um. Yeah, but that's probably how he got caught for the arson, though. Sounds like I would imagine because he he did like to go back and like watch everybody run it around. Like, I bet you a German fireman fire. knew about arsonists, serial arsonists. Maybe so. Maybe they knew that they kept coming back. Yeah. The two of the biggest, uh, two of the biggest fucking you know when, when it comes to serial arson arsonists, a lot of times they you know one of the main groups of suspects are fucking firemen. Yeah. Did you know that? Yeah. Serial arsonists become firemen quite a bit. Or at least they used to. Well, it's just kind of like, you know... Pre- you want to be you know, where the fire is. Pedophiles becoming priests yeah. or child care workers. It's like anything like that. If you're, if you're like, so inclined to commit a particular type of crime, sometimes you want to pursue a career that's going to get you yeah. as close as possible to the <clears throat> shit. And even back in Rome, pro- professional firefighters, would uh, they all had their own little companies. They would be in competition with one another. And uh, if there weren't enough fires happening, they'd go out and set a fire to make money. Yeah. People don't think of that. Well, yeah. See, that's but, that's why it's good that we don't have a for-profit fire service yeah. anymore because they would They'll legit go out and set do fires. That. They're like, man, we're like going We're broke. running out of money. We got to go fucking set a fire. <laughs> we and haven't had get, a fire in like six weeks, man. Yeah. What is this? And then they show up and they go. They see your house burning and they're going, "Okay, how much you gonna pay us for?" A, sure, for us would to put be a shame if that completely burned yeah. to the ground. <laughs> and then another fire company would show up, and the two fucking fire companies would get in a fucking war, uh, bidding war. And meanwhile, you're to trying to get going, the, to get yeah to get the business. There my house. Yeah. Oh well. Yeah. <laughs> well, they had loan agents with them. Yeah. You know what I mean? To fucking loan you the money. Yeah. To here put you the go. fire out. So the loan sharks would get your ass. I figures. Something else, huh? Yeah. So there's certain yeah, things I mean, you don't want for profit. I mean, fire comp- fire I mean as is shit one of them. as things are now, it's like <laughs> yeah. I just think back, well, it was a lot worse back then. Back then, you just had to fucking pay yeah. to keep your house from burning down. They were just burning down on purpose. Yeah. Probably. It's like the fucking mob. Yeah. <laughs> it's like much. better not to have a fire department <laughs> than to have a fire department. Because the fire. That does that, yeah. Yeah, well, yeah, it was better not it's to like, have a fire department. like, never mind, I'll just put out my own fire, yeah, thanks. <laughs> close the fire departments down. We'll put them out. Get some buckets. <laughs> get a hose. Everybody's got to have a bucket. So if the house <laughs> catches on fire, you can run down and fucking, you know, fill your bucket up. <laughs> I know, terrible. Uh, but yeah, so he gets put in prison. Now, like I said, he, he has a problem with authority, uh, but also he likes being in sure. solitary confinement. So he would, on purpose, 
like do insubordination and stuff like that. So he would get thrown in solitary because when he got thrown in solitary, he had all this peace and privacy yeah. to like construct his elaborate sexual fantasies about yeah. killing everybody in the world, like by burning everyone up and all this other kind of stuff. Yeah. And like, you know, jerk off about it. He didn't even have to jerk off about it. He said that just thinking about it just yeah, he could, he could, he could. Made him spurt off. Damn. Without damn. even touching the shit. Damn, he could just spurt off. That's what he said. Fucking shit. Damn. <laughs> so he was like super into this shit, yeah. you guys. I mean. Sounds like kind of like fucking the Joker. Yeah, this is a, he's yeah, a messed up like person. Like the original Joker. He's a messed up person. Yeah, yeah he, is, he is an agent of chaos. Yeah. Big time. So here is um, his, one of his first here's his first like official murder because like i said he thought the murder was like the 18 year old that he had strangled and stuff but they never found her so they're assuming that she lived uh but his first official official murder was uh a nine-year-old girl named christine klein now what he had taken to doing because like i said he was also a burglar and he had started specializing in uh like public bars or like inns like taverns and stuff that had like you know lodging upstairs so this is what he said um this is a quote from from him direct from his mouth he says uh it was 25th of may 1913 in a room above an inn at koln mulheim i discovered a child of about 10 asleep and this was christine klein yeah. her head was facing the window I seized it with my left hand and strangled her for about a minute and a half. The child woke up and struggled but lost consciousness. I had a small but sharp pocket knife with me and I held the child's head and cut her throat. I heard the blood spurt and drip on the mat beside the bed. It spurted in an arch right over my hand. The whole thing lasted about three minutes. Then I locked the door again and went back home to Dusseldorf. Damn. Like he was like looking around apparently in this inn for stuff to steal and he couldn't find anything. And then he just opened this door and was like, how fortuitous a nine year old girl. Damn. I'm just going to like cut her fucking throat. Now the creepy thing is that he didn't rape her, rape her, but they think that he like, this is so gross. They think that he, like, jerked off on his fingers. Like, he came on his fingers and, like, stuck his fingers in her vagina. Hmm. Because they did find, like, semen in right. there, but not, you know, to an extent. Right. And she, and he probably did it, like, really roughly, too, because they did find, like, bruising and shit. And this is from, like I said, this is from Dr. Carl Berg, who did all the autopsies. And he hmm. did the autopsy on this girl. But so he didn't I read admit that. to it, though, huh? He didn't admit um, to it. He did, yeah. Okay. He, he didn't. Ad he, he he admit to molesting the the dead body. Um, I'm not sure if he admitted to it or not. Like he admitted to pretty much everything, so I would mm. imagine so. I'm just saying I knew that because I read it in. That's what the um the coroner said, like right. in the book. But this is verified. They found the body. They know the homicide. He's talking about. Yeah, she he was she was just in bed. Okay. Okay, and the shitty thing about this is that what ended up happening was that. So this was just, like, a random crime. Nobody had seen him, like, come into the place because he broke into the inn Which or whatever. Dad, the dad got uh, accused. The of... uncle did. Damn. Because this is what happened. The dad was named Peter Klein. Okay, so yeah. they find a, a handkerchief, and it was belonged to Peter Curtin at the scene, and it had his initials on it, PK. Well, the dad's initials were also PK. Right. Now, the dad had a brother named Otto, who was Christine's uncle. Now, weirdly, coincidentally... The day before Christine was killed, Otto and P Otto and um the and the dad had had this huge argument, and Otto had said that I'm gonna do something that you'll never forget or something like that. They had like this big fight. Right. So they assumed that Otto had borrowed the dad's handkerchief, like had the dad's handkerchief with the, with the initials on it, and yeah. had killed the little girl because they had had right. this huge argument, and a They're lot of people had seen him. it. Yeah, so yeah. he actually did end up going, and I mean, Peter Curtin, he didn't know that he left, he just dropped the handkerchief, he wasn't thinking about it. It right. just so happened that the dad had the same initials, it so happened yeah. that Otto had said that fucked up shit, like, just the day before that happened. So he got convicted. How many years did he get? Um, he wasn't, he actually, they figured out that he didn't do it before too long. Like, okay. he, I think he was in there less than a year, All right. and uh, there wasn't enough evidence, so I think he was actually let go. 
Right. But, um, yeah, that's, like, really fucked up that that happened. Uh, so don't go around saying shit like that to, like, your fucking family yeah. members because you never know when somebody might get murdered coincidentally and you get fucking blamed for this shit. Yeah. Um, yeah, so... And another thing that Peter Curtin did was that the day after Christine, like, he killed her, he came back to the scene and he sat at a cafe across the street from the inn and got a beer and, like, sat out on the patio and watched. And he listened to people, like, around, like, talking about the murder and shit like that. And he was, like, just so fucking happy about it. Like, hmm. like watching everybody talking about it and being all, like, freaking out and shocked about it and whatnot. So, um, yeah, he, he said that he was, like, really gratified by, like, all the disgust and everything that everyone was, like, freaking out. Um, he also said that after she was buried, that he would go to visit her grave and that he would, um, when he touched the dirt over the coffin, yeah, he would... Blow a load. Yeah. No shit. Without even Damn. hands-free Damn. ejaculation. Just touching the dirt over the little girl's coffin, or so he Damn. said. This dude is completely, like, oversexed. He has, like, real problems. Makes you wonder. Makes you wonder how how many crimes like this are prevented by porn, by modern porn. See, I kind of think it's probably quite Does, a few. Yeah, because I think I think porn demystifies all this shit. Yeah. Just I saying. mean, I mean, we've talked about that before. How I think that, particularly people. I mean, obviously, people that grew up in like really violent or abusive. Um, yeah. You know, not everybody, clearly, but if you already have a propensity toward violence or toward toward not having inhibitions, I guess. Yeah. Um, and you grow also grow up in like a horribly abusive environment. Um, that's not going to go well for you. This dude's sexualizing shit that isn't sexual. Yeah, and yeah. he seemed to be doing that from a very, very, very young age. Yeah. Um, which the thing about it is that yes, he had a horrible childhood, but you have to think that. He had a whole bunch of siblings, and as far as I know, none of them ended up being serial yeah. killers, even though they all grew up in the same horrible environment that he did. Well, maybe. He was a little older during the time that his dad was there doing all that fucked up shit. So maybe it impacted him more because he was old enough for it to, to where he could, he could actually have an impact. It could have been the other ones are so little. That they forgot Maybe. about it or it didn't really impact in the same way. I will note, too, that his father's side of the family um, had a had a genetic history of various mental illnesses. Yeah. Hmm. So there might have been some of that going on as well. Like I said, not excusing the dude by any stretch of the imagination because he fucking knew what he was doing. He knew what he was doing. Um, and as I said, when I, re when I read like a lot of his quotes and stuff like that, he is pretty insightful about his actions like he doesn't try to excuse it really or you know other than saying i just did it revenge because i got treated so shittily but he he just didn't really seem to see anything wrong with it you know what i mean yeah he's but he's definitely a psychopath but and, he and knew that other people thought it was wrong but he didn't think it was wrong he's definitely a psychopath and i, I think i think psychopathy is slight is, has a genetic component to it so. i think it does as well so you know so it's, it's it's almost kind of like a form of autism you know, where... It has to be... I mean, it's a person who... I just don't think they can feel any regular human emotions. They don't seem to be able to feel love or well, shame not for or other guilt. Not for other people. I for think themselves, they, for sure. For themselves they feel it, but not for other people. That's why I think... And I'll, I'll get into this a little bit later. But Peter Curtin did eventually have a wife. And, um, you know, he never... Uh, you know, a lot of sources say that, oh, you know, he, he never said he loved her, I don't think, but he said he was very fond of her. Um, and he, like, did things that seemed like he was trying to help, like, help her out and stuff. And, you know, a lot of sources say it's like, oh, it's so unusual that he, like, treated her that way and everything. But I was like, I don't, I just don't think that he was capable of loving a person in the way that a normal person can love another person. I just, I don't think that he could. And I don't think that, I, I don't think that he would have thought that he could. I think that he just liked her because for what she could give him or because she was like, I don't know. I got this guy pegged as a high functioning psychopath. 
I definitely Kevin, think, yeah, a, he's definitely, I mean, if anyone is a psychopath, this fucking yeah. dude is. That's, that's for goddamn sure. So, not too long after Christine Klein was murdered, about two months later... Um, he did the same thing. Like, he breaks into this other place, like, to commit a burglary. He had a skeleton key, so I guess he was, like, breaking in there. Um, into a house in Dusseldorf and found a 17-year-old girl in there named Gertrude Franken. Um, and he actually strangled her with his bare hands. Um, blood started coming out of her mouth, which made him, of course, spontaneously ejaculate. Um, and he actually managed to get out of the house without anybody seeing him. Hmm. Now, only a couple of days after this murder, this was uh, on the 14th, 14th of July, he got arrested for um, a bunch of burglaries and some other arsons and shit like that. And this time he got six years. <clears throat> um, now, because he was such uh, an asshole and kept, you know, being insubordinate and everything like that, he got another two years tacked onto that. Uh, he did this uh, stint in a military prison uh, in a town called Brieg. So he gets out in April of 1921 and he goes to Altenburg and moves in with his sister for a little while. Now his sister has a friend named Augusta Scharf, uh, who was a couple years uh, older than him. Like I think she was three years older. Now she owned a candy store, I think. Um, she had worked as a prostitute in the past. She had also done some prison time because she had a fiance and either I can't sources differ either the fiance cheated on her or promised he was going to marry her and then reneged on it. So she shot him Damn. and killed him. Damn. So uh, she had done some, she did some time for that. So she had a little bit of a checkered past as well. So her and uh, Peter Curtin kind of hit it off and uh, you know, so they ended up getting married two years later. Now, even though they had sex and everything like that, and I guess she let him do some of the fucked up shit that he wanted to do, but he said later on that the only way that he could actually get off was to do one of his, like, fantasies. Like, fantasize about, like, killing everybody or fantasize about cutting somebody open and, like, blood spurting out and shit like that. I'm starting to think about maybe, maybe porn wouldn't have helped this dude at all. I think this guy's too far you gone. You could probably for porn. just show him some porn, and he probably wouldn't even be like, "Well, what's that?" Meh. Yeah, yeah. Probably, <laughs> it must his sexuality and vi sex and violence must have been and, and torture and shit must have been inexplicably combined yep. so early yep. on in his formation that there was no prizing it apart. You can't, at any, you can't separate it. Right? I think that's kind of what the issue was because right. he had grown up essentially watching his dad beat and rape his mother and some in of the front of him and yeah. some of the sisters. Right. Um, it just became... And then the dehumanizing elements of fucking like bestiality and yeah. fucking weird shit like that and fucking omnisexuality to where he just, you know, mixed with shit like pyromania and fucking sadism. Yeah, yeah, he, he, he couldn't save the dude. That was his sexuality at this point. Yeah, that's I, his sexual orientation. I think it started so yeah, early that right. because there are some things that if if a kid is so fucked up from like an early age and that's just all they see and they don't have any normal, um, you know, they don't have any normal relationships to look at. They don't have any normal yeah. anything. Well, his threshold was way up here from very right. beginning. So I I don't know if you can help them. No, probably not. Um, you know what I mean? Maybe I mean maybe you can. I, I you know I I think it's very rare that somebody is completely unsalvageable, but it's much harder because shit that like. Well, what are you gonna do? You gonna let a guy like that walk around society? Fuck no. You know I I don't think so either. I'm just I'm talking about not letting him run around. I'm just talking about at least like leaving him in prison, obviously, but. If, if you got somebody to, like, if he could work through, like, with a psychiatrist or whatever. Um, Maybe and, double lobotomy. And would actually, like, <laughs> be able to understand, like, and separate those two things and understand, like, why it was bad and shit. But I don't know. Nah, it's too late. This, this guy might there, be one of the few that I don't well, think there was some, any help in. Something like that could probably only take hold if you have a fucking strong genetic component. That's like, kind of what I'm suspecting. Like he genetically was probably also a, a high functioning, high IQ. Because his psychopath. dad was was right. a fucking monster right. as well. So you have a high IQ, high functioning psychopath already. Yeah, I mean, I think and his mom that, was pretty normal. And all that shit, all that shit tripped all those fucking genetic switches in him. Mm -hmm. 
all that epigenetics and type of shit it came from his dad and everything you know so nah it's just a perfect storm of a bunch of stuff that's why these guys are so odd they're rare Thankfully. it's a bunch of things happening at once and it's all coming from different places it's genetic it's environmental and you know all that happening at once, it, like you said, becomes a perfect storm. That's what this is, I think. And as I it's said, it's not one it's, thing. It's so many other things you can't fix it. Yeah, and, and, and the it's thing very is, rare. It is very rare. I mean, you know, happily, and I'm not saying that like people having abusive childhoods is rare. It's not. But the fact that it's everything else. Yeah, everything else. It has to have more than one thing because shit. If everybody that grew up in like an abusive household became a serial killer, we would be fucked. They'd be all over the place. Because yeah, there would be a lot more of them than there are now. Yeah. Right, and also the abuse is on a spectrum, too. You know, what I mean, there's abusive families that are nowhere near as bad as this one. Yeah. Or no real bad as that one. So it's on a spectrum. Yeah. So abusive family isn't enough because if you're talking about on the light end of the spectrum that shit's everywhere yeah that's what i'm saying yeah it's like you know if if that was just if was enough to make a right. serial killer then they would be all over the place yeah like most people would be serial right. killers because most people had messed up childhoods i mean you know in one way or the other nobody in, had no there right. is no perfection in nature no one had a perfect upbringing you know what I mean? Because we're you're, all just humans and we're flawed yeah, and we don't really know what we're doing. You and know. your family, no matter how special your mom and dad are to you, or no matter, and no matter how much you hate them or whatever, they're random people. You didn't choose them. Most people yeah. just have random family. Yeah. Like, you know, I look at my dad. My dad's cool, dude, but he's just random. Yeah. He just happens to be my dad. Yeah. I and mean, it affected a lot my life and upbringing, but, could it, but it could have been somebody else. Yeah. That would have been different, but it's just random. You know what I mean? Your mom's yeah. random. Yeah. It's a random fucking thing. You it is. You it's don't a crapshoot. It. Right. Which is what's kind of scary because you don't know who right. you're going to fucking right. end up with. Which I mean, is I look why... At my ex I look at my extended family, okay? Like like aunts and uncles on, on both sides of the family. Those are just fucking random people. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I know them real well. Yeah. But they were just... They could be interchanged with any other people too. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> well, it's kind of funny, you know what I mean? You take it for granted, but if you really... If you're really objective about it, they're mother they're just fucking random people. Well, guess what? You're random too. Well, yeah. Everybody's Where everybody's random. just kind of random. <laughs> We're all random. We're all fucking random. <laughs> I'm all right with that. But we have will. All right, we have will. And we have skills, and you can have. Some people don't have will, but most people have some kind of willpower. You can shape yourself into whatever you want if you have enough fucking willpower. A lot of successful motherfuckers have defied. Their random fucking families and become and, and achieved excellence. It's been a lot of that. A lot of excellent motherfuckers have some random ass or bad families. So you can't let that hold you back. Well, that's why I said I, I've always been a big advocate of because I know that there's some maybe not so much nowadays, but I know that there was a school of thought where it's like, oh, family like blood is thicker than water and family is everything and family is what. See, I'm a, I've always been a big advocate of like you said, your family they just randomly had to have you didn't choose that shit. Yeah. So, I mean, my family are lovely, but if you if you grew up in a super fucked up family, I do not think that you should feel one scintilla of guilt about cutting those motherfuckers out of your life if they are toxic. Yeah. Just cut them right out. Don't yeah. feel bad about it. Yeah. Don't let other people make you feel bad about it. It's like, oh, you know, my mom abused me, my dad abused me, this, that. Don't fucking talk to those That's fuckers anymore. Like, you don't have to. Yeah. I, I'm a big advocate of that. Like, go find yourself a good family. Go find friends. Go find people you picked that you like. You know what I mean? Go do that. Those are just people that had you. You, yeah. don't, you don't have any obligation to them, I, remember, I don't think. I remember growing up, you know, all my aunts and uncles, you kind of, you kind of, you, they're kind of idealized in your mind. Yeah. But then as you get older, especially when you start getting into your 40s and 50s, the more you find out about them, the more you realize that they're just like everybody else, really. Well, yeah, everybody's just They're just same. random. Yeah, it's no. like, well, the thing is, and, you know, I love my mom. My mom yeah. is awesome. Um, she had me when she was real young. She was only just out of high school. And um, she once told me when I was, you know, in my 30s, probably. I never thought about it. Because, like, you know, we grew up poor and stuff like that. But my mom was, like, always, like, super cool. I never, like, felt like I was deprived or anything. And she once said to me, like, when I was in my late 30s, she said, man, 
She's like, I'm paraphrasing, but she said, I'm really glad you turned out okay because I had no idea what I was doing. <laughs> yeah. She was just out of high school. Yeah. And she had a baby. She didn't really know. And I was like, you know, and she'd been holding that within like all yeah. that time. And I was just like, mom, you did fine. You, just, yeah. you know what I mean? It's like, I, didn't, I haven't killed anybody. I'm not on drugs. <laughs> I'm not, you know, it's like, it's fine. You're, you're cool. And honestly, I have three other siblings and they all turned out awesome too. So yeah. she did a good job. Even though she didn't know what she was doing, or so she said. I just thought that was very funny. But yeah, so so he marries this woman. And, um, you know, like I said, he can only, like, kind of get off by thinking about shit. And, of course, um, he uh, cheated on her all over the place. Um, he actually, although he did actually get a job for pretty much the first time in his life. Um, he worked as a, I think he's a trades union official or something like that. And uh, he had, he started an affair with a servant girl named uh, Tita, and also a housemaid. Um, so he was had a whole bunch of women couldn't going. Couldn't keep his fucking dick um, in his pants. No, he really couldn't. Yeah. And you know what I mean? That's fucking. Uh, and those two women, I guess they allowed him to do the whole choking thing. He like, had a choking you, fetish. He yeah. had a choking kind of thing. Um, now, his wife found out about him, like, catting around. And uh, one of the women actually called the police on him and uh, said that he had seduced her. One also claimed rape, which I buy it uh, because he did that kind of shit all the time. So he actually ended up getting eight months on the seduction charge. Damn. Which I didn't... <laughs> seduction, I guess that's illegal. <laughs> yeah. Well, I In think Germany that's, at that time. Yeah. Well, no, I think that might be like a euphemism for... Rape. I don't know if it's a euphemism for rape or for sexual assault. Might or, be like strong arm of sexual assault. That's kind of what I'm thinking. I don't think it's like seduction like, ooh, hey, baby. She's like, they're jail. About, <laughs> they're talking about sexual assault. I'm Yeah, I'm thinking that that's kind you of You go up there and was. grab a bitch and go, I'm going to take a pussy. Yeah. And then you start fucking grabbing her and shit. Like you don't actually rape her, but you're manhandling her. That's what they. That's what they're talking yeah, about. Yeah, which is sexual assault. That's so sexual assault, yeah. yeah. So uh, he rightly went to prison for that. So he got uh, he got eight months, but he only served six because they said, okay, well we'll let you out, but you have to leave Dusseldorf. Uh, so he said okay, but then like he appealed it, and they said okay, well you can come back. So. Hmm. There you go. Yeah. All right. So, do you want to take a break now? Cause yeah, it's we're, time for a break. We're I a little bit. Drink too. I noticed your drink was getting kind of empty. Mine's pretty full because I've been talking the whole time. But all right. So we that are going to strong drink. It's just starting to hit me right now. I'm <laughs> he, trying to hold. He's on. going to start swaying around I'm the chair, and the on. camera's going to go out of focus yeah, and shit like that. I'm just going to have to keep quiet the rest of the show. I'm going to go. Yeah. 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 Mm, yeah. 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 <laughs> You'll be all right. Yeah. <laughs> all right. So we're going to take a break, and uh, we'll be back in just a couple minutes. Pokey, get it! Get it! Oh my goodness! Oh my goodness! Oh my goodness! Oh wow! Yeah, you're beating the shit out of that. Yeah, you vanquished it, Pokey. Good girl. She loves that thing. I got it because she used to like chewing on cords. It's got catnip in it. She likes to rub it on her face. <laughs> You love true crime, I love true crime, and I've spent the last three years compiling a series of the most intriguing unsolved murders of the 20th century. It's called The Faceless Villain, and Volume 3 is available now. Featuring such fascinating cases as the Ketty Murders, the Carrie Babies Case, the Frog Boys, the Alcacer Murders, and the Anokashira Park Dismemberment Incident, The Faceless Villain, Volume 3, is an involving exploration of unsolved slang spanning the years from 1980 to 1999. Pick up your copy in print or ebook formats on Amazon, or download the audiobook version from audible.com, and get ready for a chilling journey through modern crime history. All right, we're back talking about Peter Curtin, the vampire in Dusseldorf. Or the, yeah. monster, the Dusseldorf monster. It's been a fucking wild story so far. I can't believe I've never heard of this guy. He should have been famous here in the United States. You would think that. Yeah. I mean... There's a lot of kind of European serial killers that did some really fucked up shit, particularly in the first half of the 20th century, and I'm, like, surprised that more people haven't heard about them. Well, it was over 100 years ago that this happened, so, you know, I guess it's easy to forget. Yeah, that's true, but it's like you would... I mean, you know, people still remember what fucking Jack the Ripper did. And Jack that was, the Ripper that had was good a long press. time ago. 
He had good press. Though. I and think they, the thing about Jack the Ripper is that they never caught him. So it's yeah. like you can come up with your own him. fucking theories about him. Then they made all kinds of movies about him. Yeah. We still have to see that damn, was it Time After Time? No, not Time After Time. Yeah, Time After Time. We've seen that. With Jack the Ripper. We, we reviewed it. We don't have it on fucking Blu-ray, though. No, I don't. I want, to, I want to see it again. I've seen that movie like so many times that yeah. I've memorized it. Yeah. <laughs> but David Warner makes a great fucking Jack the Ripper, I have yeah, to say. Yeah, this game's good. Yeah, I love that movie. So, Peter Curtin's um, banner year, if you want to call it that, for serial killing. Uh, the year when he just kind of said, he, seemed, he seemingly just said, fuck it, and went around committing all the crime that he could get away with, was 1929. So he started pretty early, February 3rd, 1929. He sees uh, an elderly lady in Apollonia Kuhn walking down the street. Waits till she's gone behind some bushes so that, like, passersby can't see her. Jumps on her, grabs her by the coat lapels, and screams in her face, don't scream. And then he drags her into, like, some bushes and shit like that and stabs her 24 times. Damn, she should have screamed. With a sharpened pair of scissors. Yeah, she should have screamed. Now, even though she lived, Fuck. even though, like, a lot of the stab wounds, like, went down to her bones. These were, like, like fucking deep stab wounds. But she did live. Lucky. Yeah, she was. Well, how, I don't know how lucky she was. I guess yeah. she's, it's always lucky. If you're yeah, but she was lucky but, to live. Yeah. yeah. Now, only a few days later, five days later, matter of fact, uh, Peter Curtin strangled a nine-year-old girl named Rosa Olinger. Um, he pretty much, he strangled her until she went unconscious and then started stabbing her with the scissors, uh, stabbed her in the stomach, stabbed her in the temple, which was kind of a thing to, for him. He liked to stab people in the head, like in the front of their head. Hmm. Uh, stabbed her in the vagina. Damn. Also stabbed her in the heart. And... While he was stabbing her, guess what? Spontaneous ejaculation. So, special. Damn. So, he takes this little girl's body and, like, drags it kind of under a hedge, like, to hide it, I guess. And then, like, a couple hours later, he comes back, and it seemed like he attempted to set the body on fire. Like, he came back, like, with a little bottle of gasoline or something and uh, set it on fire, had another orgasm watching the body burn, Although, according to um, Dr. Berg, the body didn't burn all the way. Like, the clothes burned, um, the skin on the thighs burned, all her hair burned off. But I guess the fire went out, like, before it consumed the body completely. It's hard to burn a body. You can't really burn a body with gasoline. There's too much fluid in it. Yeah. I'm not sure yeah. if it was gasoline or kerosene. I've seen, like, sources saying both. Wouldn't matter. I mean, the, but I went with Dr. Berg, and he said gasoline or petrol. Yeah. So, um, so I'm assuming that's what he was talking about. But, um, yeah, so I guess, I don't know if he really wanted to just destroy the body or if he just got off on the flames themselves, because it seemed like well, he, he was, was just like, too. ooh, yeah, but that's what he I mean. Wanted to so, see somebody burn. Right. So I don't think, like, he was really all that concerned about, he didn't really seem concerned about getting caught, because he just, like, would go up and stab random motherfuckers in the street. I saw an Indian dude set himself on fire, and this is, like, recently. You know, this is one of those old films. This is like a he he did he was some kind of protest. I don't really understand it. Poured gasoline on himself and he had a lighter like he was gonna set himself on fire. And he may have been threatening to set himself on fire, but he went up anyway. I think an accidental flame got him. Yeah, it works. And he burned up and man, it was uh, his clothes fell off. He was wearing like a real light, kinda like sari type thing. His clothes fell off. And his skin just snapped like a damn sheet of rubber pow, off of his body. Well, yeah. it's like And fucking, it fell. It's it, like pork crackling. Yeah, it fell off his body while he was standing there on fire. And then the fire went out, and he was still standing there alive. With no skin on. Yeah. That's why I like always thought... fucking loser. Well, no, yeah. man. I always thought, like, that's the fucking worst way. Like, yeah. when they used to, like, burn those poor women alive, like, because they said they were witches and all that kind of yeah. shit... That's got to be the worst fucking worst way, way to go. go. Oh, that's and this be guy, terrible. I just thought this dude. I just thought, you know what I mean? Like, I feel sorry for him. I feel pitiful in a way, but I also feel anger at him. You know what I mean? To tr and, and it was over something that was kind of stupid. That he thought he was going to set himself on fire in an act of defiance, and that it would kill him. Well, like the monks he used to do, like protesting the Vietnam War. Yeah, right and, and, and well, those those dudes died. Though. They did. Yeah, this they dude did. here, the flames went out quickly. 
And then he was just standing there without any damn skin. The fucking in agony for fucking a long time. And now he's going to live like that. And I was like, you fucking dumbass. I mean, if you're going to, like, seriously, if you're going to set yourself on fire and purchase something, make sure you die. Make sure you fucking die. And make sure you die fairly quickly. Because Because you don't want to live after that shit. That's what I mean. That's what I, I, people like that, um, you should remember when we fucking watched that documentary about Kane Hodder and he got, like, really badly burned, like, early in his career. And he was talking about how fucking horrible that is. Yeah. That has got to be one of the worst yeah. things to and and even if you live, it's just oh, I just can't yeah. imagine. Like you would never recover from that. Because really. you know if you live long enough, you're gonna change your mind about doing that. Like I should have done that. And yeah. you're gonna feel played as fuck. Yeah. You know what I mean? At least that dude at Burning Man that ran into that big old bonfire died. At least he died, and, and he didn't live. He didn't. He probably went out very quickly in all that heat. I would hope he ran that. right into that fire like a champ. <laughs> right in there and just went poof. Did that dude even know what he was doing? I'm, I think he did, yeah. But here's the thing. He died. Therefore, yeah. he didn't have t- t- time to regret he it. He didn't have to lay around. And lay and around like, regretting like, that shit. Did I do that? Like, I was dumb as fuck. Now, I think he wanted to kill himself, and, he, and I and I think he was in a celebration, too, that he wanted to kill himself, and, and that everybody was seeing it. Yeah. I believe. I mean, maybe somebody dug up that guy's identity. You know, maybe it was a, more of a tragic story than that, but from what I saw, dude looked happy to run into that fire, and he just winked out, because, you know what I mean, he went into the damn fire underneath all yeah. that stacked wood. Imagine how hot that was. You couldn't feel it. Especially under those drugs. I mean, That's what I really hope he didn't run. feel anything because, like I said, I've heard yeah. this the most people, from people that have survived really bad burns. That's well, like I feel like they've said that's like that's the worst agony yeah. ever. Yeah, but the the, the pain is after, is, yeah. is after the burning a lot of times. I mean, the adrenaline and this dude was on all kinds of fucking drugs. He had to have been. That's what I mean. So he's that probably high as some, fuck. Like mercy, at least. Probably on fucking LSD and all kinds of other drugs. So he probably didn't feel it. He was just, oh man, look how great it is. The flames, you know. I'm going to become I'm becoming one, one with, with the, the flames. flames. And oh my God. He did. And just went up in a fucking, I mean, it just like he winked out like a bug going into a damn bug zapper. Remember the bug zappers yeah. in the backyard? It was like. Yikes. That's was what like, I always wow. kind of like. All, like I said, all the poor women they used to burn at the stake and stuff yeah. like that. I'm like, I always kind of hope they just died from smoke inhalation. Well, they did. They fucking, Evidently, they hope... died. Evidently, they died of smoke inhalation, but they were burned and were a lot of their body before the smoke Gosh, inhalation got God them. Damn. That's so I'm sure it was horrible. miserable, you know. That's what I mean. It's like one of the ways. If you're gonna kill yourself, goddamn, there's like a lot better ways to do it. Than yeah. That. <laughs> Where you don't have to like, and then if you fuck it up and you don't like go through with it all the way. To have to live with fucking agony and scar tissue for your entire life. God, that's got to be fucking horrifying. Easiest way is guns. Or drugs. Drug yeah, over. I'm just saying. Drug overdose. Yeah, just take yeah. a whole shit ton of sleeping pills and just go to sleep and you just won't wake up. You didn't have to do that. You could just fucking pour a whole fucking bottle of damn vodka down your throat. You won't survive that. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. That might be actually kind of enjoyable. Yeah, it'll come on, <laughs> it'll come on so fast your, your body can't fucking... Um, your body can't fucking compensate for it. Yeah. You fucking die. It kills you. I mean, you could just chug a whole bottle of vodka and, like, you could throw some sleeping pills on top of it just yeah. for good measure. But I'm just saying... Man, maybe we got to cut this out because <laughs> somebody might think that we're giving advice No, I'm just shit. saying that it's, like, if... I'm just saying that, like, people that do that, I don't know yeah. why you would choose to do it in the most painful fucking way. Well, possible. some people feel that they've done wrong and they want to suffer. And they want to suffer. Um, yeah, I get that. I get when that. I was in Boston, my neighbor in my apartment, she was, in, I forgot her name now, it's been forever since I've fucking spoken to her, but she was a mental health professional and she dealt with outpatients, mental yeah. health outpatients, and a lot of them would kill themselves with fire, or some did. And Because um, they felt like they deserved it. They felt like they deserved some yeah. shit in the past. I get that. A lot of it was, like, sexually molesting other people, that type of stuff when they were younger. And, you know, they were victims of, like, sexual assault, and then they did prison time, and then maybe mental time in a mental fucking health institution, you know? And then they just kind of give up. And Well, this was this one girl that she, that is what she was telling me. That girl, she was molesting other people, and then she was molested, and she gave up, and she poured gasoline all over her fucking bed one time and set herself on fire killed her. Yeah. But that's why. 
She felt she had to suffer for what she had done. Yeah, she couldn't just, like, go to right. sleep or whatever. Yeah. That's fucked up. I mean, I can understand that. They want to go out in agony. Yeah. But she was also, like, basically schizophrenic, too. She wasn't a normal person. Yeah. So it was a bunch of stuff at once. Yeah. So, yeah, so he tried to set this uh, little girl's body on fire. They found the body the next day. Like I said, it was a little bit burned, but not all that burned because the fire had gone out. Um, Only a few days after that, actually another five days after that on the 13th of February, he actually just ran up behind this 45-year-old dude, a mechanic, whose name was Rudolph Scheer. He just ran up behind him and started stabbing him with his fucking scissors. Uh, Stabbed him in the head, stabbed him in the back, stabbed him in the eyes. Uh, all this other kind of shit, so we killed him. Now, when the cops, again, here's the thing, like you were saying about arsonists, when the cops found the body, Peter Curtin shows up to the site, and uh, he says, oh, some somebody that lives around here told me about the crime. What's going on? You know what I mean? So right. he comes, he turns up at the body site, and like is like trying to help out the cops, or like asking them what's going on, and shit like that. So he did definitely have that thing. Now, this is another thing where I think that maybe the German police might have been kind of on the ball, because even though this was three different victim profiles, if you will note, this is an an elderly woman, a nine-year-old girl, and a middle-aged man. However, uh, the investigators did note that the attacks had all happened at about the same time of day, uh, you know, about dusk, like early evening. Um, All of them had involved, like, uh, stabbing, multiple times like in quick succession um none of them had had robbery involved and all of the victims appeared to have been chosen at random so the investigators were pretty sure that this was the same person so that's pretty good because i I do feel like a lot of crimes of this nature particularly if it's not because you know i've written about a lot of crimes where you know in europe and the u.s and stuff like that if all the victims aren't the same type like if they're not all like you know prostitutes in their 20s or if they're not all like children or if they're not like they don't really link the crimes together but it does feel like the german police were yeah these are all related you know what i mean because the the mo is too similar even though the victim profiles were completely different so now between uh march and july of 1929 it did seem that peter Curtin attempted several other murders um I think it was four women that he tried to strangle. He said that he threw one of them into the Rhine River, but none of these women died. The next murder that he committed wasn't until August 11th. Now, this was a woman named Maria Kahn. Now, he actually met her on August 8th. Um, I guess he... I don't know how he met her exactly, but he said that she was a girl looking for marriage, so I don't know if he had, like, met her through an ad or something like that, like, where he asked her out on a date. So he was going to take her out on a date on the following uh, Sunday, like after he met her or after he responded or at or whatever. So he hung out with her like pretty much all day. They were like, you know, walking around the city, like eating out or whatever they were doing on the date. And then he like lures her into this meadow um, near like it was in Dusseldorf, but it was in like the Neanderthal region. Um, You know what I mean? So... He said that he lures her into this meadow. She started to get suspicious. um, And she started, like, begging. She's like, hey, like, don't hurt me. Don't kill me or whatever. But then he started strangling her, stabbed her in the head again, because that was, like, a thing. um, Because he liked all the blood coming out, you know? I guess he was, like, into, like, all the blood spurting out of the wound or whatever. No, he's Um, not drinking any of this blood. He just um, likes He did, some of them. Not until later, though. Okay. So there was only one or two that, like, he actually drank, that he admitted later that he drank the blood, which is why he's called the vampire. Yeah, he's, he, I was wondering, why, why but he was just, vampire? He was just, like, a blood guy. Like, okay. he, he, he said, yeah, he said later that he got, like, a tremendous amount of sexual gratification from the sight and the sound of blood spurting out of a wound. Like, he really, really got off on that. Yeah. You know what I mean? Um, so, yeah, so he stabs her in the chest, stabs her in the head. And then he sits on top of her and, like, just looks at her and waits for her to expire. Right. Um, And it took about an hour for her to die. Like, she was just laying there. Now, he got, like, I guess he had had, like, blood, like, on his clothes, like, from an earlier attack. And, like, his wife had seen it and was, like, 
it was kind of like, where'd you get the blood from? And he had to, like, make it up and, like, you know, make up some excuse or whatever. Yeah, but she knew how bad that bitch was. I know, I know she knew how bad he was. Yeah, although she didn't know that he was actually the vampire of Dusseldorf until later on. She right. knew that he was fucking around on her. She knew that. Yeah. Um, and she knew that he had done some bad shit in the past. I mean, she had killed the dude in the past, too. Um, but I don't think she realized the extent of it. Because, he, he, I mean... She didn't real, She didn't put it two and two together about the strangling and fetishes and all that. And no, not really. She, I don't think she did. I don't think she did. It's like, well, because, and I think we talked about this on a few of the other shows, maybe BTK and stuff like that, like serial killers that were like married and had a family life and whatever. Um, it does seem in hindsight that how could this person not know? It's like they live with this person and like, how do you, be, but one, you don't want to believe that anyone you're actually in a relationship, someone you've known for like X amount of years is actually running around being a serial killer. Like, right. I don't think anyone wants to think that. Or, you know, even if it's not someone like you're not your significant other, maybe it's somebody in your family, like your brother or sister, or whatever. And you don't want to think that about that person because you know them and it's like they would never do anything like that. Um, also, you know, like I said before, particularly when, you know, dudes like go out to work or they go out and do whatever they're doing. And particularly back in the old days when you weren't really like supposed to question them, it's like, Hey, I'm going out of my job or I'm going out to the pub or whatever. And you weren't supposed to like ask them what they were up to. You wouldn't fucking know what they were yeah. doing out there. I mean, they could say they were going to the pub. They could say they were going to work and they could be doing all kind of fucking shit. You wouldn't know about. Look at what fucking yeah. BTK was doing. Yeah. His wife didn't know about any of that shit. His kids didn't know any about that shit. I think why the same would with you? Gary Wood Ridgeway too. Yeah, why would you? It's like you wouldn't suspect that. Yeah. And uh, particularly when they come across as fairly normal, as Peter Curtin seemed to come across as a fairly normal person. He like I said, he looked real dapper, like he was always dressed very neatly, like he was always wearing a suit, he always had his hair was all nice and everything like that. So and he was like kind of charming and shit. Um, a lot of psychopaths have that. They have that kind of like easy charm. They're very, um, you know, ingratiating. So I can see how you would just like not think that somebody like that. Because I still think that people expect that criminals or serial killers and stuff like that are going to look like monsters or like weirdos. And not all of them do. Most of them look like dorks. Yeah. Look at Gary Ridgway. And not all of them come across as weirdos yeah. when you talk to them. Some of them do. I mean, you know what I mean? But... I do feel like some of the ones that get away with it for a long time, some of the ones that are straight up psychopaths, that's the whole thing with psychopaths is that they are so used to like, you know, mimicking human emotions that they can fool a lot of people. They don't come across as weird. They come across as just like a normal person. Sounds so much like my stepdad. <laughs> it does actually. <laughs> Well, and that's the weird thing. The funny thing, and I think we mentioned this when we did the show on Ted Bundy, is that even though he really did seem to come across as normal, but I did note that he seemed to come across as normal to dudes. Uh, women that knew him, other than his girlfriend, um, seemed to think he was a little creepy. Yeah. They seemed to get that, like, hey, the like weirdo Boy, vibe. Probably looking at him fucking sideways. That's what I mean. Yeah, like and skiing well, and shit. And plus, I do feel like women are more attuned to... Body language and stuff. Body language yeah. and, like, why is that dude looking at me like that? Why is that dude, like, crossing the street, like, over here? And why yeah. is that dude... Because you always have to be, like, alert to what random dudes are doing around you because you don't know which one of them is Ted Bundy. <laughs> so you definitely do have to be, like, uh, more attuned to that, I guess, than guys have to be. So maybe that's why. But this really does seem like a case where Peter Curtin seemed to come across as a normal enough guy that he could get away with doing this kind of crap. Although, like I said, he was, at this point in 1929, he was just coming up to, like, random people on the street and just, like, dragging them into bushes and stabbing them. So he decides he's going to go, because he didn't want his wife finding out about this shit. He's like, well, I don't want this body to be found yet, so I'm going to fucking hide it somewhere. So he takes um, Maria Hahn and he buries her like in this cornfield and nobody finds it for like a whole bunch of weeks. And he keeps going back. I don't think he's a necrophile like the 
the psychologist said, I don't think he, he's a necrophile exactly. Um, but he does seem to like to go back to the scene and like think about what he did and it gets him off to think about it. But what he did in Maria Hahn's case was a couple weeks after he killed her and buried her in this cornfield, he goes back to the cornfield and he said that what he had planned to do, he was going to dig her up and crucify her on a tree because he just thought that would be neat, like a neat thing to do. So he either tried to do it or thought about doing it. And then he's like, oh, well, I guess I need another person to do this because it's too hard to like lift dead weight up and then like nail it to the tree. Like, you know what I mean? Like he can't hold it up there and nail her, Right. I guess, like wrist to the tree. And he like couldn't do it. So he said, okay, well. He's full of shit though. Yeah. You know, cause you, cause you can clean a deer one man. You know what I mean? A deer might weigh a hundred pounds, 120 pounds. He's just not thinking of it. He he might be in bullshit. Because you can do it with a winch. You can winch him up there with the right equipment and a, a ladder and lash him with a rope and then nail him and then... Well, maybe he thought that that would attract too much attention. Yeah, maybe. I don't know how remote this... You don't have to do it with, with brute force. But he was just saying that it's like, oh, well, I guess I can't really, you know, just do it by myself or like, mm-hmm. you know, not the way I want to do it. So he said, well, what he did then was he just... Um, went back to the site and he dug the body up and like laid underneath it. And then like, and how long had it been buried? A couple weeks. Damn. this nasty motherfucker. Yeah. That shit was rotten. So he did dig it up. It was dug up. Yeah. Evidently. Fuck. And he That's said like that, some Gary well, Ridgeway yeah, because the body wasn't found for a little while. And he said later on, like after he got caught, he said that he kept returning to the grave and quote unquote, improving upon it. He's bullshit, and he was having sex with it. He was probably. He was I, I think that, like, like I said, the psychologist said that he didn't think that he was like a straight up necrophile, but he did um, seem to have uh, some tendencies. That bitch was a necrophile in that regard. It's the same shit Gary Ridgway was doing. Yeah, going like back a few it. weeks later, he's like, "Oh, I'm gonna go back yeah. and get another piece of." Why? That. Because it was free. Right. Exactly. It was already there. Yeah. Well, and like I said, I mean. Peter Curtin seemed to have a real big thing about thinking about killing the person. And so I think for him, I don't know if it was necrophilia exactly. I think it was just him remembering what he had done. And like, this is the result of it. And like remembering like the blood gushing out and remembering and that would like get him off because he had like a really um, vivid imagination apparently and he really, really liked to construct like, these fantasies about the killings. And he would go back to the scene and just think about it. He's and, saying it's kind of like looking at photographs of some chick that you screwed or or maybe photographs of sex you had with some chick. Yeah, BTK I'm does telling that you, too. as a man, if that's what it's like, then that means that bitch is jerking off to it. Well, yeah. You know what I mean? So he, maybe he's not actually having sex with the body, but I think he probably was. At least he's jerking off to it. Oh yeah, I don't think I don't think he would have denied that exactly. Right. I don't think he would have said that he had sex with the bodies, but I don't think he would have denied that he like would ejaculate thinking about it. But here, I'm going to take it a step further though. If you're going to dig it up and jerk off to it, and it's there, then why not just have sex with it? That's what I'm saying. Mm-hmm. He's having sex with the dead body. He's just not admitted to it. Yeah. That's what I'm just saying. Because we have noted I'm before. trying to fucking, and even though this shit's a perverse concept, I'm trying to look at it as a man. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> and as a man, I'm telling you, well, if you're going to go through all that, and you're into that, then you're going to go ahead and have sex with it. Might as well. If Gary Ridgway did it, then that means that other guys were doing it. And Gary Ridgway, because it was furry, Gary Ridgway was having sex with it when it was fucking rotten. Yeah. And even when it smelled. Yeah. And we're talking like weeks and weeks and weeks. And he didn't hot. seem all that bothered. No, about and it. that means it also had maggots in it. Yeah. And then he was going back, and the water was right there so he could wash himself off. And he's put his clothes back on, and then going back to his wife. And putting his Peter in the damn wife, fucking after he was in, the, he was in that dead body with all the maggots. Just saying. And I'm saying, when we did Just the saying. Gary Bridgeway show, it's like, did we even mention this? Because was the wife ever kind of like, why do you smell a little corpsey? I'm thinking he had 
You know how they have rape kits? Yeah. Well, he must have had like a necro kit that he brought with him. Like a bottle of bleach. A bottle and of like shampoo some... and all kinds of fucking cologne and shit so he could take off all his clothes, have sex with this rotten body, and then get his kit and take it out into the fucking water because the water was there and fucking take a bath and get all that stink off of him and then come out, dry off, and then fucking get back into his clothes. Put it all in a bag and then leave. Go yeah. back into the car. That's, that's what he was doing. That sounds like he was probably planning ahead. He had it all planned ahead. Think of all the sh- think of all the productive shit you could do if you used all that energy for planning all of this stupid crap that you were doing. I think Ridgeway would be at work thinking about that hot dead body of that girl laying out there going, it's, she's still out there. I ought to be getting that. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's like she's just laying there. She's not just laying anything. out there, right. So then he's coming up with a, it's what do like I need? Waste. What do I need? What do I have to do to get, get, you know, to go out and get that and then get away with it again? So he comes up with his necro kit. I mean, you'd think with that kind of stink, you would need like some fucking Comet and like fucking Brillo pads. no. I would think. He probably went out there and tested it. Probably some shit like lava soap. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, you need lava. Lava soap. <laughs> rags. Alcohol. You know? Yeah. Maybe some bleach water. Yeah. And a spray bottle. And spray that shit. And towels. Yeah. And then Ziploc bags to put the towels in. So the dirty towels don't contaminate the rest of the bag. You've thought too much about this. No, I've cleaned a deer. <laughs> and I have NBC training from the Army, nuclear, biological, and chemical. And you have to keep contaminated items away yeah. from uncontaminated items. So, you know, smell is a sign of contamination. Yeah. So, being being a necroperv, you're going to have to start thinking in, the, in, in that term. In terms. those terms, yeah. So, that's what he probably did. Yeah. Just a weird thing to, like, occupy your mind thinking about, that's all I'm saying. Well, he's working, so he's fantasizing about that hot, dead booty sitting out there. You know what I mean? So he's thinking, what it is that I have to do go back there and get set three seconds on that? <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? <laughs> get three seconds. Yeah, and then, because he can get three seconds, he doesn't <laughs> have to kill again. Okay, yeah. It's just sitting there. Yeah. And then he successfully gets away with that, and he goes, oh, what about thirds? <laughs> what about fourths and fifths <laughs> and then the next thing you know you know she's been out there for about three months 90 days you know what I mean she was awful soft last time I saw her you know what I mean so and then he starts eroticizing that you know what I mean some that, people oh, I was really having sex with her and her arm broke off you know weird shit like that man I hate when that that was so hot when her arm broke off <laughs> He probably did think that. Yeah, you know there. what I mean? I'm trying to put myself in this man's feet. In his shoes. <laughs> You're trying to put yourself I'm into his feet. Drunk. I'm fucking drunk. <laughs> I'm trying to put this man in this man's well, shoes. Well, actually, that's kind of more apropos, like, mm. considering that we're talking about a bunch of necromancy. Yeah, he was probably naked. When he, he's got to be naked when this is all going on. Anyway, I didn't know? really want to think about Gary Ridgway naked, so thank you for that mental image. You can't get some of that grave booty. With clothes on, it's going to get your clothes stinking. Grave booty. Well, obviously. Because it's going to get your clothes stinking. Yeah. So that means he didn't have shoes on or anything. Now I'm just, now I have this horrible mental picture of like fucking scrawny ass Gary Ridgway running around this like fucking white ass butt cheeks. Yeah, with his shoes off and his clothes in a nice neat pile. And then he walks out to that body with the flies and she was, and he's got to fucking get the flies off of. Nasty. Some, some people really have um, issues. Let's put it that way. Yeah, he issues. Was, right. Well, this dude was like that, I bet you. Down, yeah. in, the, down in the graveyard. This dude also has issues. He was like that down in the graveyard thinking about it. You know, she's pretty hot. You know. She's dead now. She's not going to put up a fight or anything. All I got to do is dig her up. And I could have like a second or third run on that. Easy peasy. Maybe fourth. Yeah, right, right. Right. It's free. That's what he's thinking. Yeah, like I said, it seems yeah. seems such a shame to just leave it laying there. Yeah, you're letting it waste. Yeah. yeah. He's frugal. That's, yeah, that's yeah. Yeah, yeah, he's frugal. He's frugal, yeah. 
This is this is so messed up. All this yeah. <laughs> How do we get into these fucking conversations? You're the one to pick this. You're the one to pick this topic. I know. I'm trying like, to rationalize. I'm fascinated the topic. by this kind of stuff, but then in a way, I'm just like, what the fuck is the matter with you? What is the matter with you? I wish I could just like every single one of the dudes that we have done shows about. Yeah. I wish I could just like. I'm trying to rationalize. Shake them. I'm trying to rationalize it. You know what I mean? The behavior. I'm trying to put myself in his position. Yeah. I'm trying to put my normal masculine motives, you know what I mean, into these perverse motives. You try to I'm trying to just say the victim is like just some hot girl you want to date and you want to have sex with her. But in his case, he's already killed it. That doesn't necessarily mean that he doesn't still want to date her. Yeah. So you have to. So she remains the same. That you know what I mean. So, what would you do? Just because she's dead doesn't mean you still don't want it. Yeah. So how do you go about this? And that's got to be what he's going through. I would imagine it right. probably is. I mean, right. I can't think of any other justification. Right. And I think that's probably, like you said, I think that's the case with uh, Peter Ridgewood. Curtin here, too. Peter Curtin here, too. Yeah, yeah. A lot is of that, it. you know, there has to be some kind of little bit of necrophiliac something or other to I go back a, a few weeks guys. later yeah. and be like, hey, I'm like, I'm going to mess with the body. I'm going to lay underneath it and get some quote unquote satisfaction from that. He put her on top and he was screwing her. That's what was going on and she was dead. Yeah. Probably. You see, this is like, he's using them kind of like porn. All right? But it's 3D. Well, it's like a blow-up doll. It's like a real doll. doll. Right. Except with maggots. Right. Well, eventually. And it's probably a slow process where you're accepting more and more. I just threw up in my mouth a little bit. You're you're (laughs) accepting more and more of this necrodynamic. The necrodynamic. Yes, right. That's like, of the necro game. <laughs> that would be a great horror movie, the necro dynamic. I would watch a horror movie called that. Gotta make a fucking t-shirt. The necro dynamic. <laughs> We're gonna be on so many watch lists by yeah, the yeah, time yeah. it's like wearing these fucking t-shirts. Yeah. Nobody's gonna know. What I'm gonna do about. like a silk screen of some hot, fucking really hot chick. She just happens to be dead. The necro <laughs> dynamic. Yeah. It's like, don't be so racist. Don't it's be like, so racist against the dead people. <laughs> against dead people. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. We're getting a whole weird area here. <laughs> All right. Well, we're talking about a weird motherfucker. He is a weird motherfucker. I will say that. So I'm just trying to you know, analyze it and, and give you my take on it and then bring that take to the masses. Yeah. Yeah, no. Because everybody needs to hear a whole It's got to be what it is. It's got to be what they're thinking. Yeah, I, I imagine it probably is. And pe- yeah. I mean, people, people like Peter Curtin particularly, and some of these other serial killers too, it's like they're, it seems like their sex drive is yeah. way, way, way like overboard. And that's like their whole entire like yeah. focus in life. Like, because like I said, you know, I do the fucking on Instagram, if you guys know, I do like uh, Dennis's sexual problems, like yeah. with BTK and everything. And some of the weird shit that he says, it just seems like his entire life is based around his weird sexual fantasies. He has, like, code names for everything. He has acronyms for everything. It just seems like that is what his entire being is tied up with, which is very weird to me. It's like everybody everybody has a sex drive that's normal, but... The fact that it's just this all-consuming force and it just drives you to do these things and you come up with these fucking elaborate scenarios yeah. is just, that is fucking crazy to me. That's why I'm saying this whole story about him laying under it and everything, this is just a fucking youth, euphemism. Yeah, that's what he's telling the investigators. That's not what happened. He put her up on top of there and was fucking boning her. Yeah. And the investigators didn't check. Well, yeah, I wonder. You think those if, like, early nineteen hundred guys are going to start digging around in an old dead vag, trying to find some dead dude yeah, dropping like, no seed in there? You. Yeah, that, but that's what that's what happened. That's what really happened. Probably because why the yeah. fuck else would you lay under? I mean, go yeah. all that trouble. That's what he's talking about. Yeah, that's not stop. So, so he apparently did this for a while, and then finally, three months after he killed her, 
he sent um, a letter anonymously to the cops and said that he did it. And he drew like a little map, like where her body was. And even though the map was kind of shitty, like it was good enough that the police actually did find the body. Now, after he had killed Maria Kuhn, I guess Peter Curtin decided, well, I better change my MO or change my weapon of choice so that the police won't catch me. So for a while, he'd been stabbing everybody with scissors. Now he decided um, that he was going to start killing people with a hammer. So, you know, in an effort to, like, disguise that it was the same person. Yeah. Um, But he did actually still kind of, like, use a scissor sometimes. But he kind of, like, changed it up, I guess. So on uh, August 21st, he finds an 18-year-old girl walking down the street, stabs her. Also stabs a 30-year-old man and a 37-year-old woman. This was all, like, on the same day. He's just, like, running around, like, stabbing random ass people. Yeah, this is essentially, like, a spree. He's just, like, freaking out. Um, He, um, all of them lived. Now, they were able to, like, give, like, a loose description uh, of him to the police, but they all said, look, this dude just, like, he didn't say anything. He just, like, walked up and, like, fucking started stabbing, you know, so we didn't know what the fuck was going on. Now, three days after this... Uh, which was, you know, August 24th. He was um, at a fairground and he saw two little girls who were foster sisters. Uh, One of them was five and one of them was 14. And they were walking home from the fairground. So he goes up to them and he takes, like, the older girl who's 14, her, uh, her name was Louise Lenzen, and he gave her some money and said, hey, why don't you go back to the fairground and buy me some cigarettes? So she did. And then he takes the little girl, the five-year-old, and he picks her up and, like, takes her off into the bushes and strangled her and then cut her throat and then threw her body into, like, a patch of beans or some shit. Now, when her foster sister comes back, um, he starts strangling her as well and then starts stabbing her in the chest. Uh, One of the uh, wounds penetrated her heart, her aorta. And he also, and this is where he got the Vampire of Dusseldorf thing, he also bit and cut her throat and then started sucking blood from the wounds. Hmm. Um, So neither of these girls was sexually assaulted. So it does seem like he was just, and like I said, some of the earlier ones, like what he would do was he would just like spontaneously ejaculate while he was killing them. And then sometimes he would just like take his fucking cum covered hand and like stick his fingers in their vaginas and stuff like he would do that kind of shit Ugh. you know what i mean which like i said is that fucking gross it's so fucking like gross. a surrogate yeah it's almost kind of like he's like not sexually functional he is though i mean according to like his wife and all his mistresses okay because he had a shit ton of mistresses too that's true so it wasn't like he was it's impotent weird. because some yeah. serial killers are and they yeah. just kind of like you know because I, I feel like Weird. BTK had a little bit of that going on, too, because he didn't really, like, rape any of the victims. Like, sometimes he would, like, jizz on them or into their underwear or something like that, but he didn't, like, rape them. His whole thing was control. Tying a bitch up and control. He liked that. Yeah, I think, and I think it's, it's the same kind of thing with this right. guy. It, it just seems like he got off so much on the blood flow and on the yeah. killing that he didn't need to rape them, yeah, essentially. I, so. I mean, yeah. he did rape some of the victims, but it does seem like he was so excited just, just by... just got a big charge out of it. Out yeah. of the killing itself that he didn't even really need to do that. You know what I mean? Then um, he goes up to another woman uh, who was 27. Her name was Gertrude Schulte. Now, he just goes up to her and, like, fucking bold as brass just says to her, says to her, hey, have sex with me. She says, reportedly, <laughs> I'd rather die. Yeah. And he says, well, die then. Then he starts stabbing her Damn. in the fucking head and the neck and everything. Now, she uh, actually did survive, although she um, couldn't give a real good description of him. She said he was, like, middle-aged and he was, like, not all that, um, uh, you know, he wasn't all that memorable looking. That's basically what she said. Um, he also did two more attempted murders after that. Uh, one he attempted to strangle. One he attempted to stab. Um, that was in September. Neither of those victims died. And then he decided he was just going to go full on hammer attacks from this point forward. So 30th of September, he runs into this 31 year old servant girl named Ida Reuter. 
And this was at uh, a train station, I believe, in Dusseldorf. Now, he basically said, hey, why don't you just, like, come to me? Like I said, he was actually quite charming and not a bad-looking dude. So she said, hey, come to come with me to a cafe. And then they're going to go for a walk, like, through this, like, park or whatever. And then when they're walking through the park, he decides he's just going to start fucking hitting her in the head. So he just, like, starts hitting her in the head with a fucking hammer, um, both during and uh, after he raped her. So he did rape this victim. Hmm. Now... <clears throat> Uh, 11 days after that, uh, which was October 11th, he runs into another servant girl who was 22. Her name was Elizabeth Dorier. This was outside of a theater. Um, again, he kind of asked her for a date, like, hey, come to this cafe, have a drink with me, have a coffee or whatever. So she goes with him. Then they took a train. Then they took a walk. Um, and then he started beating her around the head with a hammer and left her for dead. Now... She didn't die immediately, although she did die the next day. Like, they found her. She was still alive. And they took her to the hospital, but she was in a coma, and she never woke up from the coma, and she died the next day. Uh, October 25th, uh, he attacked two more women with a hammer. Both survived. Um, in, this, in the case of the second woman, it was because the hammer that he was using broke while he was attacking her. Now, November 7th, 1929... Uh, he finds a five-year-old girl named Gertrude Alberman uh, walking down the street and says, hey, why don't you come with me over here to, like, where these houses are? Like, all these houses were, like, empty. And then he picks her up by the throat and strangled her and then stabbed her in the head with a pair of scissors and then stabbed her a further 34 times in the head and chest and then left her in a pile of nettles. Now, by this time, like I said, the investigators were pretty sure all of these attacks were perpetrated by the same person who, at this point, they had started to call the Vampire of Dusseldorf. Um, and had gotten, like, it was in all the papers in Germany. It was actually, like, all the way around the world. Like, it was uh, big, uh, big news. So, they basically, um, the investigators, like I said, they think this is the same person. They're, like, asking the public, like, what is going on? Like, please give us some tips and stuff like that. So... They get, like, 13,000 letters, like, claiming they know who the guy is. Um, they just, like, go and through, like, pursuing all the leads and everything. 9,000 inter uh, interviews were undertaken with various persons of interest, witnesses, suspects, whatever. Um, and they compiled a list of 900,000 names of potential suspects in this case. So they were actually doing their due diligence and going through, but there was, like, so many people to get through that it was just, like, taking them forever. So now, two days after this five-year-old little girl was killed, Gertrude Alberman, so this other newspaper gets a map saying where Maria Hahn's body is, which, as, you know, if you'll remember, like, he had sent one to another newspaper earlier as well. And he also included a map in this letter of where he left Gertrude Alberman's body, which the police had already found. Now, they actually gave the two letters to a graphologist who was like a handwriting analysis uh, specialist. And like I said, they determined that these two letters had been written by the same person. And so that was like more, um, you know, evidence that they, you know, what they already suspected, that these attacks were all perpetrated by the same person because the handwriting looked the same. So between uh, February and May of 1930, apparently, uh, you know, Peter Curtin engaged in a bunch of other attacks, none of which were fatal, thankfully. Uh, but many of them were hammer attacks and attempted strangulations. Uh, this ended up being a total of 10 victims, all of which survived. Um, and all of them were able to describe their attacker to the police as well, so they did have like a description of what he looked like. Goes to show, I guess a hammer isn't all that deadly. Yeah, it was just kind of like when we talked about, like, the Axeman of New Orleans and shit like that. I was, like, amazed that yeah. so many people could be struck in the head with an axe blade and still survive and be mostly okay. Like, weird. other than maybe losing some teeth. Right. But, yeah, but, like, it's weird because most of, like, the Axeman of New Orleans, I was under the impression that, like, he had just killed a whole bunch of people. He did kill a bunch of people, but a lot of his, most of his victims survived, even though they were struck in the head with an axe, which, that was, like freaking me out. I, I don't know. I just always thought, like, Axe would just, like, fucking split your head open and you'd be dead immediately. But so, okay. May 13th, May 14th, rather, 1930. So there's this woman named Maria Budlick, 
Uh, she's 20 years old, and she is at Dusseldorf Station, the train station. Now, this guy comes up to her, and he finds out, he's like, oh, well, she's on her way to Dusseldorf. She's looking for, you know, she's just moved there. She's looking for work. She's looking for a place to stay. So this guy says, hey, I'll show you where there's like a hostel you can stay at, blah, blah, blah. So she's like, all right. So she starts going with him, and he starts like trying to lead her through this park where like not a lot of people were. So she's kind of like, yeah, this seems a little sketchy. And they started fighting, like arguing. And you would think that that guy was Peter Curtin, but it wasn't. This guy was Peter Curtin. Then this, this guy that comes up to her and was basically like, um, oh, is this guy bothering you? What? That was Peter Curtin. Damn. The first guy was also obviously going to do something bad because he was trying to like lead her away to some fucking... This is why you can't fucking trust anybody, I'm telling you. Like, trying to lead her away into some fucking abandoned park or some shit. And she was like, yeah, I don't like that. So then this other guy comes up, hey, can I help you? And that was a serial killer. Damn. So, special. So, yeah, he comes up and he's like, okay, well, is this guy bothering you? And uh, she was like, yeah, he is totally bothering, bothering me. So that first guy, like, walked off, right? So... Peter Curtin says, hey, why don't you come to my house and have a meal and drink? I know you're hungry and everything. And then she was kind of like, well, she wanted something to eat, but she knew that he was probably like wanting something. She's like, look, dude, I'm not having sex with you. She basically said like straight to his face. And he was like, that's totally fine. Just come on. I'll show you where there's like a hotel where you can stay at. So he starts, like, leading her somewhere. Like I said, she's just arrived in town. She's not, like, from around here, so she doesn't really know her way around. He starts, like, leading her into these fucking woods or some shit, and then he fucking grabs her by the throat and tries to strangle her and rapes her. Damn. So she starts screaming um, and eventually, like, fights him off and gets away from him. Now, she told him, like, specifically, like, she fucking ran off, and she had told him that she didn't remember because he, t like, kind of took her to where she, where he lived, right? And, like, show her where, where she lived, where he lived. And she said that she didn't remember where that was, which was a lie, which good for her. Um, now, she did not report the assault to police. However, what she did do was she wrote a letter to a friend of hers and was like, listen to this fucked up shit that happened to me, right? Now, amazingly, she wrote the letter to her friend, but she put the wrong address on it. So when it got to the post office, like, the clerk at the post office was like, this isn't the right address. Like, I wonder where this is supposed to be. And he, so he opened it so, like, so he could read it and try to figure out where it was supposed to go. And he read it and he was like, holy shit. And he gave it to the cops. So the, the cops read the letter and they go and find, the, find her. And they're like, okay, um, do you remember where this miscreant lives? And she says, Yes, indeed, I do. And she took them right to Peter Curtin's hmm. fucking boarding house. So they go there. It's like Peter Curtin, I guess he comes there and he sees her and he sees the cops at the house. And he's like, oh, shit, I'm busted. So then, like, he tried to, like, you know, scoot out the back or whatever. Because they go to the, like, the landlady and they're like, hey, who is this motherfucker that lives in this apartment? And she says, oh, it's Peter Curtin. She knew exactly who he was. Now, apparently, Peter Curtin was very surprised that his last victim, Maria Budlick, like, lied and said that she didn't remember where his address was, even though she remembered where it was, hmm. which I thought was very funny. It was kind of like BTK, like, right. amazed that the cops like, would lie to him about yeah, the floppy like, disk and, like, how yeah, it could be traced. You guys, yeah. What? You're not allowed to lie to me? Yeah, Stop. It's like, you're funny. <laughs> it's like, so BTK. this just cracked me up that he thought, oh, she's just a woman. She's too dumb to, like remember yeah. where I live, and just like, she remembered exactly where he lived. BTK was a fucking sucker. <laughs> he was a dumbass. Yeah. So yeah, so he, so he got out, but like, eventually, what he did, okay, so what Peter Curtin does is that he knows now, he's like, okay, well, they know my name, they know where I live, they know everything, so I'm probably gonna get busted. So he goes back to his house, and he tells his wife, Augusta, He's like, okay, well, the cops are after me. I mean, she was like, because he had been in prison, like, in and out his whole entire life. She had been in prison. Like, she knew the deal, I guess. So he says to her, all he says to her at first is that, 
um, yeah, I raped this girl, Maria Budlick. He admitted that. And he said, um, I had all these prior convictions, so I'm going to get caught. And if I get caught, um, I'll probably get 15 years hard labor, you know, or I might get put away forever. Um, so what you should do is you should turn me in because if you turn me in, then you'll get the reward bunny and you'll be set up for the rest of your life. That's what, that's what he said. Right. Um, so he was trying to, like I said, I don't think he loved his wife in the sense that a normal person loves a person, but he did say that he was very fond of her and he did say that he wanted her to be okay, like for the rest of her life, like that she would have enough money to live because she was apparently upset. I think what ended up happening was that she was going to like, when he came back and said, Hey, I did this bad thing. I think she was going to kill herself, not because she was like, oh, I love you so much and blah, blah, blah. But she's like, well, you've essentially ruined my whole life. I'm going to be destitute now um, because you're going to prison. So I don't really have any reason for living anymore. And he didn't want her to do that. That's the same thing BTK had. Yeah. I mean, he was loyal to his family. Yeah. No, he fucked him over. Yeah, which is totally fucking weird. It's it's weird that they can separate those two things. But like I said, BTK had a word for it. He called it cubing. Yeah. Like it goes into a different box. Right. He thought he was a family man. Great family man. Yeah. And an upstanding pillar of society. Even though you ruined your whole entire family's life. Like, he didn't make that connection, which just fucking kills me. Yeah, I'm a a pillar of society. You know, I'm I'm upstanding and doing the Lord's work, go to church, but my family loves me. Oh, this other thing I do on the side, that's not really me. It's just part of me. That's the X factor, you know. Yeah, don't worry about it. Yeah. That was, that's another me. Like, he didn't think that that would bleed over. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a separate thing. Yeah. That's why yeah, the, yeah. this whole thing where they can compartmentalize in yeah. that way and, like, put things in different boxes, I'm like, yeah, that's not how life works. Yeah. Life is not in one box and it doesn't, like, scooch over into this other box. That's, that's, not, the way it that's works. not how shit happens. That's the way it works. It works for them because they're... Yeah. It's easy for them to they're do. They're fucked up. They can switch yeah. from one thing to another, but it doesn't yeah. really seem to occur to them that it real life is not like that like just shit bleeds into each other they rationalize though yeah you can't like do that kind of shit and expect that it's not going to have any kind of lasting impression like lasting effects like on your family i mean obviously so yeah so the same thing seems to have applied here um so like i said initially he just confessed this one rape and he's like so i want you to get the money so turn me in so um She actually ended up contacting the police the next day. And she said that even though he came back later and said, okay, I'm the vampire of Dusseldorf. Like he eventually did confess it to her. Um, She said she didn't know anything about that. And honestly, she probably didn't. I mean, she knew that he fucked around on her. She knew that he was probably like a shit person. She didn't know what the vampire Dusseldorf was though, huh? But I don't think, well, I don't think she... She knew that he was the vampire of Dusseldorf. I mean, obviously, she knew that that shit was going on, because everybody knew that shit. Because it was, like, a big deal. But I don't think she knew that it was him. I don't think she put the two things together. So, um, so, yeah, she basically went to the cops, and they had planned it all out, and she said, he said that he's going to meet me at this church or whatever, and so um, she went there to meet him, and, like, the, the cops were there, and they took him into custody. So as soon as they took him into custody, he pretty much like confessed uh, to all the crimes, including some that they didn't even know about uh, that had been accidents or hadn't even been discovered. Um, He actually ended up admitting to 68 crimes, uh, including 10 murders and 31 attempted murders. And like I said, he didn't really try to excuse them exactly, but he did say that it was basically as revenge because, you know, his childhood was shitty, like, all the time that he spent in prison was shitty, like, everyone had been shitty to him his whole entire life, so he was basically, it was retribution, is how he kind of um, saw it. I don't buy it. I don't either. Um, And honestly, most of the, even the psychiatrists at the time were like, maybe that was 10% of it, but 90% of it was lust, sexual was a sexual proclivity. That's what he was doing. He was getting off on it. That's what he told, it that was the excuse he gave to investigators, but I'm just, I'm just not, I'm not feeling it. That's what the motive was. Yeah. 
No. He had a perverse sexuality. He was well, yeah, on. and like I said, even psychiatrists at the time that's, said that's, that. That's all they said, yeah, maybe retribution was like a tiny percentage of it, yeah. but almost all of it was because right. he just got off on it. He yeah. was a sadistic, sexual psychopath, and I think he just liked same, it. I think it's the same thing as BTK. Yeah. Different manifestation, but like a BTK. Yeah. And he did later admit, too, and like I said, this uh, kind of plays into the whole vampire thing, that Maria Hahn was another one that he had, like, drunk so much. He said that he drunk so much blood from her neck that he threw up. Like, mm. he just drank so much that was coming out. Yeah. He also said that he had cut the head off a swan and drank all the blood that was, like, shooting out of the neck, like, after yeah. he cut it off. And, like, he really got off on that uh, and ejaculated, of course. He's always fucking ejaculating. <laughs> so. He's a, so. He's a coomer. <laughs> so like i said um after he got arrested and uh he was um you know found guilty within like a couple of hours of uh all, of all the murders and he was undergoing um interviews by dr carl berg who would later come out with the with the book the, Sa- the sadist and he's basically like he basically admitted that sexual pleasure was his main uh focus was his main motive and he said, pretty much the only way that I can achieve sexual inc- excitement is by seeing blood or engaging in violent acts, either like thinking about it or actually doing it. Um, and that he was like really into like, you know, just being alone and thinking about all this kind of stuff. So despite all this, I, I do feel like Curtin, as they usually do, like his defense team was like, well, um, I think his initial plea was he was going to plead not guilty by reason of insanity. Um, But because the psychiatrist was like, yeah, he's fucked up, but he totally knew what he was doing. He's completely sane. So they let him stand trial for murder in April of 1931. Uh, He got charged with nine counts of murder and seven of attempted murder. Um, So his plea was not guilty by reason of insanity, but... Now, while he was at the trial, I love this. They kept him in a cage. It was like, it, it was just like his head was sticking out the top. <laughs> oh, and kidding. then like the cage and then like he had his legs like chained to the ground. Because he was like, I guess they thought he was going to go on a rampage like King Kong or some awesome. shit. <laughs> well, it, that's not too crazy because he did kind of go rampaging around the fucking street stabbing random people. So it's That's like, kind of like that Russian serial killer. They did that to him too. Dude, put Andre Chikatilo. Yeah, didn't they put him in a fucking glass box? For trial. Yeah. yeah. They've done that. They do that a couple yeah. times. They've done that in Italy and like yeah. a few other ones. They just like, when they don't even want to fucking, <laughs> they're like, just get in the box, motherfucker. Yeah. We don't even want you running around. So yeah, so they put him in the fucking cage. Um, but yeah, he says all kind of shit like, and there's some fucking quotes that he said like while he was even on the stand, he was like talking to the judge and stuff like that. He says, uh, talking about his arson, he says, when my desire for injuring people awoke, the love of setting fire to things awoke as well. The sight of the flames excited me, but above all, it was the excitement of the attempts to extinguish, extinguish the fire and the agitation of those who saw their property being destroyed. Hmm. Now, the judge asked him at some point, like, if he had any conscience or remorse or any pity or anything like that. And Peter Curtin said, and I quote, I have none. Never have I felt any misgiving in my soul. Never did I think to myself that what I did was bad, even though human society condemns it. My blood and the blood of my victims must be on the heads of my torturers. (laughs) The punishments I have suffered have destroyed all my feelings as a human being. That was why I had no pity for my victims. That's what he said. Okay, so he said that at first he had pleaded guilty just so his wife could get the reward money for turning him in. And then he said, like, a few days into the trial, he said, like, no, I'm not guilty. Like, when he first, like, entered the plea, he was like, no, I'm not guilty, reason of insanity. And they were like, yeah, no, you're not going, you're not, we're not falling for that. Then a couple days into the trial, he's like, okay, no, I want to change my plea back to guilty again could have been that he realized that going to an insane asylum would be worse than going to would prison. be worse That's and i think that he kind of had a little bit of a death wish as i will get into yeah. a little bit because one of his best quotes was one of the shit they asked him like before they fucking executed him but um so he said to the court the, and this is also a du- direct quote quote he said i have no remorse as to whether recollection of my deeds makes me feel ashamed 
I will tell you that thinking back to all the details is not at all unpleasant. I rather enjoy it. And they asked him about his wife also, and he said, Why don't you understand that I am fond of my wife and that I am still fond of her? I've done many wrongs, have been unfaithful over and over again. My wife has never done any wrong. Even when she heard of the many prison sentences I've served, she said, I won't let you down, otherwise you'll be lost altogether. I wanted to fix for my wife a carefree old age. Which, okay, I guess that was nice. That's a, that's a that's like the only good thing he did. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> so the trial only ended up lasting 10 days. So the jury deliberated for less than two hours and then came back and gave him the verdict guilty and sentenced to death on nine counts of murder. Also found guilty of seven counts of attempted murder. And Peter Curtin really didn't seem to give that much of a shit about it. They said he was just kind of like, yep, that's how shit goes. Um, he, he had did, his run. He's yeah, he trained. didn't appeal it. Um, he did apparently submit a petition for pardon to the Minister of Justice. <laughs> like that would have worked. Who And actually, the Minister of Justice was against capital punishment. But okay. even then, the Minister of Justice was like, mm, no. Yeah. <laughs> you can't have that. We're right. going to kill you, bud. It's like, I'm against capital punishment in theory, but you're, you're an exception. So the pardon wasn't for release. It was for the death sentence. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. So, um, but you know, at the end, all he asked for, he's like, you know, can I write letters to my confessor, my wife, and everything like that? So they let him do that. Uh, he had his last meal on July 1st, 1931, which was, in case you're interested, wiener schnitzel, fried potatoes, and a bottle of white wine. Okay. Um, he ate the whole thing and asked for seconds. Because it's like, hey, you're not going to get another chance. To yeah, say right, you yeah. better. 6 o'clock a.m. on the morning of July 2nd. They took him to the guillotine, because that's right. what they did back then, 1931. Yeah. You could hear that shit falling on its way down. Though. Yeah, so... Like well, riding yeah. a roller coaster. <laughs> oh, man. That's messed up. Well, it's a, beheading is always, like, scared the shit out of me. Because like, I don't oh, think yeah. it kills you instantly. I think I don't think so either. That's what really bothers me. Shit, yeah. And that's, like... What, yeah, that's what I'm getting to. So yeah. he gets, like, to the fucking yeah. guillotine. They, they're going to put his head in there. He turns to the psychiatrist. I'm assuming it's Dr. Berg. And he asks him, and I'm quoting, Tell me, after my head is chopped off, will I still be able to hear, at least for a moment, the sound of my own blood gushing from the stump of my neck? Oh, shit. And the doctor says, yeah, you'll probably be able to hear that for a few seconds. And he and Peter Curtin says, that would be the pleasure to end all pleasures. Oh, shit. He wanted to hear his own blood coming from his fucking neck stump. <laughs> Dude, it's hardcore. <laughs> I guess if you want to call it to me. He was metal after all. He earned that umlaut. I'm just saying. He was into it. And so they asked him. They put his head in the fucking guillotine and they said, do you have any last words? And he smiled and said, no. Yeah. And they cut his fucking head off. Damn. Now, after they cut his head off, as they used to do back then, they might still do nowadays. I don't know. They don't cut people's heads off nowadays, but... They took his brain and wanted to see what the fuck is the matter with this shit. No, uh, no obvious abnormalities in the brain. Did they reach down in the bucket and look at the head and, and, and call his name, see if the eyes open? Oh, I don't think they did. Oh, you be? would think that they would want to do that, like, especially in his case. After that, after he said that fucked up shit, I'd want to pick his ass up by the hair yeah. and be like, hey, Pete, you still in there? They did that during the Reign of Terror in They France. did, yeah. Fucking people were like... They would, like, slap their faces and slap stuff. Slap the face and fucking the eyes would open back up. See that, like, oh. Yeah, yeah. That's one of the most horrible things I can yeah. think of. That's what, ever since, you know what I think, you know what I think, like, really scarred me for life about that was the omen. Like, the pain yeah. of glass, like, beheading David Warner. Yeah. Like, you know, I saw that when I was, like, five or six years old, and that fucking traumatized yeah. me for life. So I've been, like, I'm, like, really, like, kind of, quote, like, sort of half fascinated, half horrified by beheadings. And so when I heard about that, maybe when they cut your head off, like for a second or two, you can still kind of, you still kind of know what's going on. And like for a second, you might be aware that like, hey, my head's not attached to my body anymore. And it's like, that is really one of the most horrifying things I can think of. But apparently Peter Curtin was really like, got an erection at that idea, I guess. Now, it seems si like now science says that when your head is cut off, the head part experiences a massive loss of blood pressure. It would, yeah. But it might take Which, a second. Well, they say, science says, 
that massive loss of blood pressure equates to all near instant fucking yeah. unconsciousness. But I know from experience that what science says doesn't always directly relate to personal experience. There is a chance that you might be aware of what happened after the I mean, it would be death. a very, very brief time. Be brief. But it all that smack in the time. face and the eyes open up and the mouth moving. And being like, hey, why are you smacking Yeah, me? chances are it's, oh, shit. <laughs> That's what I mean. It's like, oh, I really do not want to get oh, killed that Oh, shit. Way. That's why I always thought that, like, I know they thought the guillotine was, like, supposed to be more, um... More I humane. Guess, I guess it was supposed to be, like, a more humane execution. I'm like, yeah. it's... It, I'd argue that it's more humane than burning people alive, sure. Yeah. But it's no. still not really all that no. humane. I mean, especially if you know that it's like, oh, shit, my head's not attached to my body anymore. That, oh, that must be no. horrifying. Even if it's only for a second or no. two. The, the most humane is what we do here in the United States. Lethal injection. Yeah, because, I, I feel like you just go yeah, to sleep. Right. It's not because painful. The first thing to hit you with is a bunch of like sodium pentothal. Yeah. And I've had that for you know for surgery. It hits you and you just oh man. Yay, all right. Yay. <laughs> and then all of a sudden you woo, you go into la la land. And then after that they you, you put a bunch of poisons into you you can't recover from. That's what I mean. To so, me, that seems if you're gonna right. do it, that just seems like the only way to do That's it. Way to go. It just seems like you know the last thing you think of would be like, woohoo, I feel yeah. so good, and then you'd be yeah. dead. Like you wouldn't even realize yeah. it's not even painful. The gas anything. chamber is not that good because those dudes fucking fight it and hold their breath and all. That's that what I mean. I don't, yeah. I don't. And electric chair is not good either yeah. because sometimes that fucking goes awry. I've seen that really. Yeah, go electric awry. chair would be about like because I've been electrocuted before too. That would be like getting hit with a baseball bat. Boom. And I've seen, like yeah. I said, and I've seen ones where they messed it up. Yeah. And it didn't like kill the person right away, and it took a few fries. Yeah. You know what I mean? And, and it's it like, oh, burn. yeah, that's what that would have to not smoke be. in certain areas. Yeah, and it's yeah. like sometimes their head will catch fire, like their hair yeah. will catch fire and stuff. It's like, no, thank you, that is <laughs> fucked up. So, like I said, so after they cut his hat off, they took his brain and tried to see like if there was anything fucking broken in there, and there wasn't. Now, interestingly, they also mummified his head. Now, it went missing for a little while, but later it turned up, and you can still go and see it, as far as I know nowadays, in the fucking Ripley's Believe It or Not Museum in the Wisconsin Dells. I don't know how it ended up there, but that's where yeah. it is. And I even found, like, pictures of his fucking head, and it's got, like, pictures. Of it. It's fucking gross looking. And it's, like, bisected. I'm not really yeah. sure why they bisected the head. I guess because they were just trying to pop the brain out, and they are like, hey... It's like spatchcock and a chicken. We're just like taking the fucking brain out the easiest possible. I don't fucking know. But yeah, so uh, as I said earlier, uh, the film M, if you haven't seen it by uh, directed by Fritz Lang, is partially based on this dude starring Peter Lorre. Also based on a couple of the other serial killers that run around at that time, like, uh, you know, Vampire Van uh, Fritz Harmon and all those kind of dudes about a child killer. So, uh, yeah, check that fucking out. There was also a movie that came out in, I guess it was a French movie that came out in 1965 called The Vampire of Dusseldorf that was also about him. And then there was a, another one that came out in 2009, actually, which I haven't seen, and it's called A Normal. And um, I think it's it's Eastern European film or something like that, but this was uh, about him as well. So, uh, yeah, check that out. I'm, like, surprised that... I'm surprised that this guy isn't, like, better known. I had heard of him, but he's not, like, one of the big ones that when you ask the average person about, like, the best-known serial killers, he's not one of the ones, he's not one of the names that comes up. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I just wonder why that is, because he did, like, some really, really fucked up shit. Like, drinking blood and, like, just stabbing random people and fucking little kids and men and women and just everybody. It was still a good show. You think? I still think it was a good show. How drunk are you? Fucking drunk. <laughs> you always think it's a good show. It's a good yeah, show. Well, I'm still somewhat sober because I only had one drink and I drank yeah. it very slowly because I was like trying to get through my notes even though I lost my place a whole bunch of times, but I'm going to edit that we'll shit We'll edit out. that shit out. <laughs> <laughs> well, I kept going through and I'm just like, oh, I don't need that. I don't need that. I don't need that. You know what I mean? All right. So are you done? You want to shut it down? I quit this bitch. You quit this bitch? I quit this bitch. You do? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> shut it down. Okay, I'm going to shut it down. All right, so...
<laughs> Hopefully you guys have enjoyed uh, episode 197 about serial killer Peter Curtin. And remember, if you like the show, please like, share, subscribe on all your social media. It really does help us out a lot. If you'd like to financially support the show, go to our Patreon page, patreon.com slash 13 o'clock podcast. Or you can go to our blog, 13 o'clock podcast.wordpress.com. And there's a button in the sidebar to a PayPal account, which goes right to little old me and will be used for various upgrades for the show and paying bills and various other things. If you would like to give a one-time donation, also much appreciated. <sighs> <laughs> we got good plans for the show we do yeah, yeah. we're gonna keep going keep expanding keep yeah. doing all kind of shit 200th one is coming up soon yeah. we'll probably do some live streaming right around then we haven't figured out exactly what we're gonna do but we'll figure out something out so uh until next time bye